it's just weird. Like, I was trying to think about this. Like, I was using this as a mental exercise. If I showed up in a town Mm -hmm. and I was a stranger, how long would it take me to realize that people were weird about me touching their kids? Like, uh, yeah. giving them a hi- <laughs> high five or a handshake? <laughs> I would never find out. you never find out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. I wouldn't try to high five these kids, or if they didn't high five me, I wouldn't take it personally. I think it was strange. Maybe that's right. big game of hug tag. Let's go hug tag, everybody. God awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema, or they'll send us back to the science lab. I'm your host, Noah Illusions, and sitting 700 miles to my immediate left is my good friend, Heath Enright. Heath, welcome back. Thanks, Noah. So, you know who's hilarious? Who's that? Peacock. Bird. <laughs> <laughs> They're funny. Yep, yep. Pretty, pretty damn funny. We're going to explain that. We're going to explain are, that. Are we, though? Are we? All right, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? I'm amazing, Noah. (laughs) Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. This is one of the movies that, like, reminds us why we do this thing. But before we get to that, I have not one, but two special new guest masochists to welcome. We have two policy wonks who have committed themselves to the only subject darker and more tedious than Christian cinema the mind of Alex Jones. Jordan and Dan are the hosts of the Knowledge Flight Podcast. Gentlemen, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, thank thanks. you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Good to be here. All right. So as you know, as one of three people that has volunteered to read David Icke books, I don't know that I have the and any place to ask this, but I have to anyway. Why Alex Jones? I mean, he's just confusing as hell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, mean, I think I think there's a blowhard answer I could give, but the simple sure. answer is he's just fascinating. Yeah. He's like a he's a he's a pathway into understanding like right wing narratives and right wing ideology, but he's also really weird. Yeah, it's like P.T. Barnum was in the John Birch Society. Yes, <laughs> like it's that kind of like you're an amazing showman, but you're also utterly insane and anti-communist but, but, for no reason. But at the same time, P.T. Barnum is weirder than the real world P.T. Barnum. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Is he a persona? Yes, he is. In court, he had to admit that he was a persona. <laughs> right. He would tell you that his lawyer said that. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, it, Powell it, it depends said on, that. Yeah. But, right, right. Yeah, who was asking, <laughs> I, I guess. All right, so uh, fascinating. He is, in fact, the gift that keeps on giving, so uh, we, we'll I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the show. But before we get to that, Heath, tell us. And I'm so excited to hear the answer to this question. No, you're not. Just don't build it oh, up like that. Yeah, no, it's Please amazing. Oh, what will we be breaking <laughs> down today? Okay, the, the, the movie, the answer is amazing. We watched The Bells of Innocence. <laughs> it's the story of a priest, a rabbi, and a peacock walking into a bar. Now, I'm not going <laughs> to spoil that amazing setup with a punchline. We will get there. I will say we watched a movie with Chuck Norris, Mike Norris, his son, and David yes. A.R. White. And it was fucking delightful. I unabashedly loved watching this movie. It's so good. Bad good. I am. I, I, I Look, I, I said this at the end of the show last week, but I've been looking forward to this so long. Years ago at one of our live shows, a couple of listeners gave me a copy of this movie, a DVD copy of this movie, and I've watched it a hundred fucking times. I loved it. I show this to people when they ask me what I do for a living. This movie is <laughs> fucking amazing. It's so good that when you listed the stars, you didn't even mention that Marshall Teague is in the motherfucker. Marshall Teague is in this movie. That's correct. Oh. All right, so Eli, how bad was this movie? Well, if you love touching other people's children and you're pretty sure that anybody who thinks that's weird is part of a demon cult, <laughs> you <laughs> are Mike Norris. You're Mike yeah. Norris. Mm-hmm. And you you probably love this movie. Yeah. What? <laughs> that's <laughs> terrifyingly accurate. All right, so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Yeah, I'm going to go with best worst Next up on YouTube when I watched it. <laughs> so YouTube was very certain that I wanted to watch a long playlist of terrible movies right after I watched this. That included Roadhouse, Broken Arrow, Over the Top, and Jim Cotta. We've done all of those movies on wow. the show before. Yeah. <laughs> and not from YouTube. The algorithm is getting way too good. <laughs> <laughs> 
Might as well suggest you've got something in your teeth, Heath. Yes. <laughs> right. YouTube was standing behind me somehow. Yeah. Oh, hold on. Real quick. Real quick. Are you saying to me that you think Roadhouse is a good, bad movie and not the greatest movie of all time? Oh, no. I spent two hours defending that movie when we did Roadhouse. Okay. Yeah, it yeah. Was, okay. Yeah. Yep. There was a lot of tears. You know, we came apart. We came back together again. <laughs> Come on. Patrick Swayze doing the Thai cheese all sweaty. Because, listen, Look. I don't know if I can swear on this show, but I used to fuck guys like you in prison, if that's what you're telling me. <laughs> all right? Look, Jordan, <laughs> Roadhouse is good, but it's no Bells of Innocence. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> that's true. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, no, this movie could have used Patrick Swayze doing some Tai Chi. So, like, I'll be fair. I'm going to be fair on both yeah. sides. So, along those same lines, this is such a weird category to have in one's life, but best, worst, child death. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Which one? Well, the, okay, the, the backstory <laughs> child death in this is so fucking over the top that I laughed my ass off. And then I realized how hard I was laughing at a child dying in a movie, and I laughed all over again. It's amazing. In context, I won't seem horrible. For that. I have a lot to say about that child death, but I assume we'll get to it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And see, I'm going to go with best worst. That's odd. <laughs> Throughout this movie. So little preview. We're about to watch three people who are delivering Bibles to Mexico. Their plane crashes and they end up in this weird town that's run by a satanic cult, I think. However, Everything that they find odd about this town until 14 seconds before the end of the movie is just stuff Christians do. Being unfriendly, not allowing alcohol in their town, not being welcoming to outsiders. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. They, they keep finding the wrong goddamn things odd. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Jordan, Dan, any best worsts? My best worst. I have uh, the best worst scene of all time. And I know we're going to be more specific later on in the show, but there's a scene where Jux, <laughs> which is the only way to pronounce his name. That's the Jux. name of a character in the movie. A main Jux character. is the name of the character. It's short uh, for Juxworth. He's in the... <laughs> <laughs> Darkwing Jux, I believe. <laughs> he's in the hotel. Juxifer. All right. And it's quiet. And at a certain point, he turns the radio on and immediately creepy music yes. starts playing. It's a tiny fucking radio, too. Right? Yeah, it's a tiny old-timey radio from 1920s. And it starts playing creepy music, which in movie parlance means that the radio is playing the creepy music. You, that's the language we're meant to understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And then in the window pops up a little evil hooded figure. Hello. Chuck <laughs> turns and looks and the head pops down. <laughs> and then the next shot we see is that he is on the second floor. Right. Yeah. Yep. The, the light goes out in the window. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So somehow this must have been two hooded figures, one on top of the other. It's the best worst <laughs> haunting. Yes. It had to have been one guy being like, lift me up a little bit so I can see. <laughs> Give me a boost. Give me a boost. Yeah. I got to go bother Mike Norris. Let me sit on your shoulders. Afterwards, we'll sneak into an R-rated movie. Come on. And then Finger. they just move on. Yep. What are you going to do up there, man? Uh, I'm just going to put my face in his window. And go, yeah, exactly. It. It's going to be the best. Hold on. I'm going to wait until, let me wait until the diegetic soundtrack is right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's hope he turns on creepy music. I'm going to put a flaming bag of shit <laughs> hovering outside of his window and then run away. For my best worst, I would say best worst. Is it a wig? <laughs> <laughs> I spent a lot of time trying to figure out if Norris is rocking a wig. Yeah. Chuck Norris. Yeah. It looks bad. Is he? His it's not good. His hair looks bad. It's wispy. He somehow predicted everyone's haircut post pandemic in this movie, which was made in 2003. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. All right. Well, as you may have gathered from our introduction, we have a lot of the fuck to get to. So we're going to keep the break brief. And when we come back, we'll dive into all the stylized strolling that is the Bells of Innocence. All right. Well, it looks like you're all ready to sign up for your wireless plan with Big Cell Phone Company. All I need you to do is sign this contract. Uh, what was that? Oh, it's just, it just that happens when people are about to sign our contracts. Don't you don't don't worry about it. It's just a thing. Really? Heath, stop. There's a better way. Eli, what are you doing here? I'm here to stop you from signing that contract. Those always have a catch. Oh, is that true? Well, it, it depends. How how firm are you about keeping your soul? Meh. Uh, Heath, you can try Mint Mobile. Oh, what's 
Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. Wait, that's impossible. No, Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. By cutting out retail stores, there's no crazy overhead cost that gets passed down to you in the form of mystery fees. Instead, Mint just passes on sweet savings direct to you. But there must be a catch. There, there, there must be. No way. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with a seven-day money-back guarantee. Wow, that sounds great. So do you offer that, sir? Uh, no. Hmm. It's true. When Mint Mobile started sponsoring our show, I actually switched my cell plan over. Service is great, and I save a ton on my wireless bill. All right, Eli, I'm in. How do I sign up? To get your new wireless plan for just $15 a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash gam. That's mintmobile.com slash gam. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash gam. All right. Thanks, Eli. Sorry, sir. No deal. Okay. okay. What? If I throw in a Mounds bar. Ooh, Mounds bar, really? Keith, we can buy one on the drive home. Yeah, I, he's got it right here. I want it right now. Okay. What that old marshmallow? <laughs> okay, everyone. Welcome to the first writer's meeting for the Bells of Innocence. I got to say, I'm so excited for this star-studded cast that I get to work with. First up, David A.R. White. <laughs> so happy to be here, guys. Oh, we so are happy. We are happy to have you, man. Love your stuff. And of course, the Chuck Norris has agreed to be in eight minutes of the movie. But no kicks. Yep. Yeah. No, we heard you the, the first time, Mr. Norris. I am willing to point. Oh, OK, well, we'll work in some pointing. We've also got the comedy stylings of Carrie Scott. I learned a joke. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And of course, uh, Mike Norris is also here. My dad wouldn't do the movie unless you hired me. Yep, that is true. Isn't that right, Dad? Uh, who are you? Oh, come on, Dad. I'm Mike. We've been over this. Anyway, okay. So, so Mike was kind enough to write up a brief summary of the script that he's written for us. So let me uh, let me take a look at this. Um, it's the story of a guy who had a little girl, but she died, and so he goes to this town to try to. Uh, to touch all the children, but they won't let him even for a second, which is weird. So they probably worship Satan or something. I'm sorry, Mike. You want to make a movie about your character's attempt to touch other people's children? Yeah, and be like friends with them and stuff. Yeah, that, that's not better. Oh, Mike, I remember you now. You're the one with the kid touching thing, right? Finally. Okay. okay. And we're back for the breakdown, and we're going to open up on a, a father, a son, and a donkey silhouetted against the sun and what they're certain is an artistic moment. <laughs> <laughs> the music here is fantastic. I have it down as having unprotected sex to the call to Mecca. <laughs> <laughs> we literally get two minutes of donkey walking here. Yep. That's the start to the movie. Yeah. Well, it, what's great is that eventually the donkey out walks the track they have for the camera. So they have to just start like panning over to the side to follow it. It's hard to push in the sand. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just have the donkey read the credits and then move on? I was rocking out to these jams. <laughs> I have admitted many times publicly that I do not have the best taste in music, but I had yes, you no do. complaints about the sound work in this movie. I was surprised that uh, the later, like half the back part was done by the Deftones or something? Like, yeah. that was intense. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there was a weird kind of like, I, I thought it was bold for a Christian movie because I felt like their audience was going to be sitting there going, wait, is this music going to make me a gay Muslim? Hold on. Hold on a second. <laughs> so then we, we get past the credits and we open up on two quote unquote Native Americans. Ooh. Would we say Native Americans? <laughs> These are very clearly two white people dressed up as like the Washington football mascot thing going on <laughs> for Halloween. Yeah, to, uh, some dude who can't not tell you about how his grandma's dad was full-blooded Cherokee or whatever is with a kid, <laughs> and they're in uh, Native American garb. It took me until the second watch to make any sense of this cold opening. Yeah. <laughs> I legitimately, when Jordan and I were watching the movie, 
I reminded him of the cold opening, like towards the end of the movie. Yeah, yeah. And you were like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Hold on. What That's happened? a great point. Why? What What did this have to do with in the movie? What is this supposed to be? Is this the future or the past? Well, this is 1932. Yeah. The, and the kid. When is the movie? The movie is 2003. Yes. The movie is yeah. present. Okay. Yeah. So the kid who gets saved by the Chuck Norris that you don't know is Chuck Norris except for the voice. Yes. That's the guy who has the weird premonition about the plane crashing. Yeah. So he's 80 years old in the present day. (laughs) At least. He is at least 80 80. years old. Yes. Yes. That ties it together. This is a good movie. Right. Now it all makes sense. And that (laughs) premonition, I mean, spoilers for the rest of the movie, will never have any fucking thing to do nope. with the rest of the film. Nope, nope, nope. nope. <laughs> yeah. It's just a reason to be weirdly colonial towards a <laughs> Native American for no reason. <laughs> yes. Reason to use that mascot outfit that somebody yeah. clearly owned. Chuck right. Norris bought those at like a closing Halloween adventure and he was like, <laughs> if you don't let me put these on two human beings, I am not going to be 100% in your movie. <laughs> 100% what happened. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, so some bad guys monster things or something in cloaks come out of the woods to kill the Native American father and son. The son runs away. He gets on the donkey and hauls ass, falls off the donkey hard. He falls. Wait, wait, no, no, no. no, no. They're not going. They're not going after the father and son. They're incidental. They're chasing that guy with the flannel shirt. in (laughs) The uh, Nirvana fan in 1932 is the one who's getting chased. And he's like, you got to save your son, dude. And they're uh, like, we're outtakes from Lawrence of Arabia. I don't know what we're doing here. (laughs) I don't know why we're here, man. The uncle yeah. uh, coming back from his wood shop is yeah, exactly. being chased exactly. by druids or something. Uh, running yeah. away from the mosh pit where they were, yeah, or something. Yeah. Who the hell? Even, but yeah, so the, but the kid get, runs away and luckily spirit Chuck Norris is there. So he's going to be fine. My working theory is that that guy who's bald with the flannel shirt was trying to fly some Bibles to Mexico back in 1932. <laughs> <laughs> See, this this whole thing rhymes. It's a cycle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Repeats every 70 years. There's right. Amelia Earhart who disappeared and then that guy <laughs> who got fucked over. By- <laughs> actually <laughs> pretty <laughs> close to the Bermuda Triangle right here. <laughs> All right. So now we, we're done with that. We, we've cut to present day Dallas. We're at a church. And you know it's a movie because it's a black preacher with a white congregation. All white. <laughs> All yep. white, yep. an all white congregation. <laughs> in fact, Just putting that out there, they're so white. David A. R. White is there. In fact, oh yeah. <laughs> now he may not be a star to to Jordan and Dan, but of course he's a star to us. I believe this is what this this is our twenty something David A. R. White movie. I do believe most of my notes are like David A. R. White's really in the movie. There he is. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> You guys are so excited. Yeah, I have no idea who this dude is. And now I found out, one, he works all the time. I'm vaguely <laughs> familiar with him from trailers for movies I'll never watch. Right. So David like Aaron White movies. is like the gazillionaire creator of the God's Not Dead franchise. Mm-hmm. And the main like force behind Pure Flix, which is something else that most people probably don't know all that much about. But I would say half a gazillion at this point. Well, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Despite yeah. having a career making anti-divorce movies. Yeah. I'm having this amazingly <laughs> meta moment where I realize what we're doing to our poor guests, where we're like, no, come on into the middle of this furry convention. All right. So this is Sulu <laughs> Chan, all right? <laughs> you can put your fist in his ass, but so much worse because furries are so much nicer <laughs> so- and less shitty. <laughs> the David A.R. Whiteness. It's interesting to me, though, because I, I have this fascination with like really deep lore mm-hmm. and like the idea of these things existing that we don't know anything about. We just live our lives. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And meanwhile, there's like a <laughs> hundred movies that this dude has made. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's just going on below the surface of your everyday life. Yeah. It's some creepy it's, shit. I've got a love crafty and glimpse of this. <laughs> <laughs> this eldritch horror there that is, is David a, White. There is a watcher in this movie, Dan. Yeah, there, there is. is. Watcher. Yeah. If you come to a town in Maine with us, we can show you David A.R. White as he rises out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> when the stars are right, it is prophesied. In Relier, David White lays dreaming. 
I have a question to you guys then. Does David R. White kick ass in any of these movies? Is oh, he like yes. a known ass kicker? Fuck yeah, he Every does. Oh, he does. Single okay. one. No, no, no. Okay, so if, if you really want to see David A.R. White kick ass, you got to watch uh, what was it? Revolution Road. Oh, he, he beats up Brian Bosworth with a giant magical hammer that <laughs> Yeah. Has. Oh, he kicks a lot of ass. <laughs> I, I heard Brian Bosworth and I was like, in my head, I saw Barry Bostwick, and I was like, I want to watch that movie. I want to see Barry Either Bostwick way. get his ass kicked by this dude. That sounds great. I'm not going to lie. I had the same mental image. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what we learned from this scene is that, yes, David A.R. White is a part of the film, and that him and two buddies, the gang that's going to make up the protagonists of this film, are on a mission to fly some Bibles to Mexico. There's a moment where David A.R. White says to the congregation that's just purchased all these Bibles, the people down there in that impoverished town couldn't ask for a more gracious gift. And all of us wrote in our notes, couldn't they, though? Could <laughs> Not food, <laughs> so money. So many other things. <laughs> all right. So after the church service is over, Davy is being seen off. And this is where we learn, of course, that Mike Norris's character's name is Jux. Jux! <laughs> that was a problem. Hey, uh, that soda I pitched to Coca-Cola where they had me arrested halfway through the meeting didn't pan out. Do you want to use the name for your movie? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll use that. His name is Chuck Jonas. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah. So I learned that Mike Norris's character's name was Jux. I got so hard, I got lightheaded. I came back to the movie afterwards. And we get this scene where we have to meet Mike Norris, and he's troubled, right? He's he's laying on his bed, having his dead daughter flashbacks. Yeah. This is a second place in my greatest, worst movie scene of all time right here. <laughs> this one is amazing. You didn't care for the visual metaphor of the ceiling fan? <laughs> <laughs> So, first, yeah, first of all, he's laying shirtless on the bed because if he lays on his back, it kind of looks like he's got abs, right? <laughs> that counts, Noah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I got I to I gotta side with that counting, yeah. too. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. So, but then he's having these flashbacks, and we get like him pushing her on the swing, and she's like, I love you, Daddy. And then we get him pushing her on the bike, right? And she finally rides the bike on her own, and one second later gets, I'm guessing, hit by a car. Yep. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Oh, yeah. There's the sound effects for sure. It's yeah. a car. Yeah, we studied car. this like the Zapruder film to yeah. figure out what. <laughs> like, we slowed this down and we were trying to figure out the amount of jewels yeah. that he put on that bike to figure out who exactly was at fault. You guys yeah. think Jordan's joking, but I no. researched the top speed on a bike. <laughs> yes. <laughs> tried to map it out. There is no way. Nope. He just not murdered his kid. Yeah. yeah. 100% he pushed his daughter into traffic. Absolutely. Just Jamie Heineman firing a daughter. <laughs> All right. No. It's, he just Killed pushes it. her in front of a car and then is like, what have I done? And they're on the edge of a sidewalk. Yes. It's, not like, it's not like they're in the middle of a sidewalk. Unless that car was driving down the fucking sidewalk, they would have to be. It's two seconds afterwards. He had to intentionally time. He's like, okay, car's coming <laughs> yeah. in three to and push and then of course he acts <laughs> like it's a big deal because the guy who just hit his daughter can see him now right <laughs> yeah he was getting rid of that kid <laughs> <laughs> they needed to establish somehow that the car was where it shouldn't have been. Yeah. Or <laughs> he's a murderer. Yes. 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 So he's a murderer. Right. He's a murderer. Yes. Yeah. The great yeah. thing, too, if you notice the path behind them is winding. Like if you just pushed her in the other direction <laughs> right. on the bike, right. she yeah. would have lived. <laughs> yep. I was scared for her this whole time. I was like, run, little girl. You had a flashback <laughs> in a Christian movie. You're about to definitely die. <laughs> You're going to totally do. Get out. Get out. <laughs> you're about to be put in a refrigerator and you're going to make this movie happen. <laughs> As a case of the yeah, rules. Ex exactly. Turn it to Hodor or something. I don't know. <laughs> As a character, you are a prop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then as if that wasn't lazy enough exposition, right? The pushing the bike into traffic wasn't lazy enough. We also hear his wife in just in a sort of an audio flashback as we watch him and his abs under the ceiling fan. His wife is going like, I blame you for the death of our daughter. Daughter, and I'm leaving you as a direct consequence, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, you killed our daughter. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> Based on what we just saw is a very reasonable reaction. To yeah. what just happened. If I was his wife, I'd be pissed too. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 
So, okay. So then he plays a little Russian roulette. Mm-hmm. Because, well, <laughs> well he- this is what I'm saying. This is why it's my favorite scene in the movie. Yes. Because it's implied that this is how he wakes up yes. every morning. Yes. Right. He, he say, says, another day. He says, you get another day whenever it clicks. So how many times has he done this on a daily basis? Right. Is what I want to yeah. know. He's like Schrodinger's catting himself constantly. <laughs> yeah. Did, did he just kill his daughter like a few days ago. I think right. so. It, it has to be, right? I get the sense that it's incredibly recent. Yeah, it's super recent. Very unlikely that it was more than 10 days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Statistically. <laughs> Statistically, we're getting into dangerous territory. <laughs> It'd be pretty funny if it was like two years and he's just like, God damn it. Okay. <laughs> Fuck. This is very unlikely. <laughs> this is very unlikely. All right. I'm I think I may have proved day. quantum suicide theory, guys. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think I fucked up. And Schrodinger's cat is 100% dominating my life. <laughs> I think I'm a wave function. Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me throw this out there because Mike Norris places this gun under the very tip of his chin. Yes, and how <laughs> Yeah. Maybe he has succeeded several times at this point. <laughs> Gotten a rug burn. Hey, Mike Norris is actually Jay Leno. Mike yeah, Norris exactly. is Jay Leno. We figured it out. They pan up to the ceiling. There's just like 150 holes in it. Yeah. Yeah. One more day. I mean, I don't mean to criticize a man's Russian roulette technique, but yeah, you want to point at the brain, I think. <laughs> Yeah, the last thing you would want if you're suicidal Jux doing like his Russian roulette is to have the gun go off <laughs> and it not finish the job. But right. Just from a narrative perspective, that doesn't. Yeah, that, yeah. that's a problem. <laughs> All right. So now we also have to go meet Oren. He's going to be our comic relief. Again, a guy I'm sure you guys have never fucking heard of, but he's Kerry Scott. We know him from Amerageddon, God's Not Dead 1, God's Not Dead 2, Faith of Our Fathers, Redeemed, the two, first two Revelation Road movies, Jerusalem Countdown, Holy Man Undercover. <laughs> oh, wow. This is the furry guy who likes the candlestick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we should be talking about flavors of Omega Brain to bring you guys in on this. <laughs> you remember Black Cherry? It was a year and a half ago. They did it as a limited run. Well, like, I saw that guy and I had a really intense like, ah, shit, I know this guy from somewhere, but I didn't like what I saw him in yeah. kind of vibe. <laughs> mm-hmm. And now that you mention it, I think it must have been Amerigeddon because Alex Jones is in that. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so I have watched that before. How that, great was Amerigeddon? So, I... I might I might have blocked out a lot of it. I, I, <laughs> Wait, Mike, Mike Norris was in that too, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah he was. Yeah, yeah, I think we did a live show for America. And was, we did. We did a ton. We That's had a correct. Ton of fun. And Mike Norris came on Infowars to promote it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I should see that. I should look that up. All right. So, yeah, but so he's going to, I'm going to use the term comic relief very loosely as I describe this guy. But apparently they read about running jokes and took it super literal. Yeah, because this is where we introduce the running joke, which is his peacock joke. (laughs) And I wouldn't call it a running joke throughout the film so much as I would call it the only thing he will say or do for the rest of this 90 minute movie. That and bitch about stuff. Yeah, he does it a lot. If the peacock joke bought like the number one GoFundMe sponsor shot for this movie, (laughs) this peacock joke makes sense. It's buzz marketing for the streaming service that doesn't exist at this point in 2003. (laughs) All right, so, but the gang meets up, Oren and and Jux and David A.R. White all meet up at the airplane to fly to Mexico. And um, Mike Norris is apparently their their pilot. So they're on the flight here, and they're having the, uh, hey, man, isn't it about time you rub some dirt in that dead daughter shit and get back to church? <laughs> yep. Kind of a moment. The guy's flying Bibles to Mexico right fucking now. And they're <laughs> acting like he's not Christian enough. <laughs> yeah, we miss you in church. Is this, is this because your daughter's dead? It's because your daughter's dead, isn't no, it? No, it's obviously. <laughs> that whole, like, we miss you at church thing really gave me flashbacks of, like, <laughs> What it was like when I used to go to church, like everybody being hyper intrusive. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. Like, yeah. Thinking they're helping and just being like, I just leave me alone. Right. Now, <laughs> here's here's something that I didn't even think about. All right. If he is a member of this church and his daughter died recently. Yeah. 
Are you telling me that nobody at his church brought him like food or checks on him? He's just in his shitty apartment. Doing Russian roulette. Yeah, doing yeah. Russian roulette. <laughs> Every time I've uh, been in a church situation where somebody died, the whole church comes together no, and they're no. like, let me help you out. This church's strategy is more on the we're guilting you for not coming. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. say. <laughs> Fuck you guys. They keep showing up at his door. He's got a revolver. They're like, lasagna? <laughs> Never mind. You know Never what? Mind. Sorry. <laughs> also, is there an investigation into the child's death? <laughs> <laughs> is that why he's flying to Mexico? That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they should have told him not to leave the county. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but speaking of which, so apparently Carol Baskin's been fucking with their plane because it starts shedding parts over uh, Texas or something suddenly. <laughs> right? Like we, we hear like what sounds like a large chunk of the plane falling off, and then David A.R. White and Oren are like, is that, is that bad? Part, is that yeah. one of the parts that we need? Or uh... yeah. Mike Norris reacts like he's pretty sure he just needs to slap the side of the plane a couple of times. <laughs> blow on it. Yeah. We also have uh, the kid that got rescued in 1932 from the beginning. We have him wandering into some church telling somebody like, I have sensed danger for Mike Norris. Again, he looks great. Yeah. He's 80 something. Yeah. He looks yeah. Great. yeah. <laughs> Fucking nailing it. Also, that's that's got a great exchange there where the guy's like, Hey, there's evil coming to this town and your God isn't going to be able to do anything. And uh-huh. then the priest interrupts and he's like, nah, our God isn't going to be able yes! to do anything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's like, okay. Let me That's probably the one successful line of the movie. <laughs> Could be. Yeah. <laughs> he may be impotent, but he's our impotent yeah. overlord. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Your God doesn't exist. Yours is a figment of your imagination. Uh, <laughs> we've been over this. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, but Mike's got to land this plane. The, the engines are failing or whatever. And of course, they don't have the money to crash this plane or even land it super hard. <laughs> so <laughs> they just land and the camera's pointed up so we can't see that it's on a runway. <laughs> It's so boring. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> it's the most boring plane I'm crash I've ever seen. I'm terrified of oh, yeah. flying. Like, I have to get drunk before I get on a plane just because of my anxiety. And watching that, I had no problem with it. I was like, ah, <laughs> this might be uncomfortable a little bit, but I, I wasn't scared at all. Yeah, they're going to be fine. Yeah. It seems like it seems like he's keeping the plane fairly level. Yeah. They're gliding pretty well. Yeah. He's, yeah. Doing, he's doing all right for uh, There's no big dips. The landing gear is out. What do you think? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, right. I mean, they're flying at 80 feet of altitude. So well, that's it's, it. not yeah. big of a, right. it's like a paper airplane landing. Yeah. <laughs> 50 miles an hour. Right. Yeah, they were exactly. flying slower than he pushed his daughter's bike is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, but they land, and then, bless his little heart, fucking Carrie Scott tries to comic relief in the back, and it's just, we to, to the point where we all feel sorry for him. I'm a, I'm never flying again. Ba, 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 no! A, a better yep. scene in the air would have been, like, we've got too much weight. <laughs> we got to <laughs> here, Oren! Yeah, the, we, we got to throw out either Oren or the Bibles. Come on, you fat ass! <laughs> Mike Norris starts pushing little girls out the window over and over again. How many did you bring? Is that six little girls? <laughs> Tell your peacock joke to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> so and so these assholes just start wandering around. Now, keep in mind, they have a fucking airplane here. They don't take any supplies from it. They're not carrying a bag or anything. They're just like, ah, we're in a desert. We don't know where we are. Let's go. I, I'm thinking left. You guys want to go left? <laughs> they're also wearing, they're all wearing jackets and yep. long pants walking through the desert, too. Yeah. They yeah, yeah. Them take off their jackets. <laughs> Not even trying to like put it over their head or no. anything. Just like, well, fine. Jux is wearing sunglasses. We'll make it. It looks cool. <laughs> yeah. What if we run into some chicks in the desert? Think, <laughs> yeah. Think. <laughs> Jux is newly single. So yeah. <laughs> this scene in any other movie would involve them like drenched in sweat. Totally. Too, yep, and like totally. showing the wear and tear of the desert. <laughs> yeah. And yep. That's not to be seen. And it's a three minute long scene. Yes. It's too long. Which puts together from our opening scene at least another two minutes of walking. Mm-hmm. Yep. I want to say this movie is an hour and 30 minutes long and it is an hour of walking. Yep. yep. To music. Well, and I tell you what, in my mind, the subplot of this movie was that David A.R. White and Mike Norris were trying to out cool walk one another <laughs> yeah. throughout. So now they're they're wandering through the desert and they suddenly they hear bells. They hear the sound of bells and they're like, oh, fuck, man, that's in the title. We should probably <laughs> follow that. Right. I love they actually have to sit there and go like. 
bells. Bells mean people. People mean help. We should go find us. It would just be like people would just go like, hey, bells. We should, and, and we wouldn't have to say anything else. <laughs> Because they're worried the audience would be like, no, it could be a naturally occurring bell, you but idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get a cactus that gets big enough and it swings yes. just right in the breeze. <laughs> this is where we come to one of my biggest problems with this movie. Oh. There is only one bell. Oh, yeah. Yep. Jordan did talk about this a There's lot. There's one bell. There are no bells of innocence. There is oh, a single bell. You're right. It is a singular <laughs> bell. That's fair. We do not see any other bells. There's only one bell that is missing. I think it's implied that all bells are innocent. I feel like... I retract my problem, Ben. <laughs> no, I feel like I deserve like a 50% discount on this goddamn DVD. I'm going back for my money. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I was promised bells in this... Uh, yeah. <laughs> also, how great so, would it be if Richard Belzer just showed up? <laughs> yeah. Hey, the Bells of Innocence, B L Z yeah. of Innocence. <laughs> Detective amazing. Munch is here to save the day. Yeah, he's Munch. <laughs> He'd have to be Munch. He'd have to be Munch. Oh, yeah. 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 This ties into the Law and Order yeah. universe, the Homicide on the Streets universe, X Files, everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Arrested development. <laughs> Arrest and, and the Bells of Innocence. And the Bells of Innocence. Oh, yeah. You All got it. One universe. <laughs> the Bells of Earth, if you. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Clive Davis wanders in. He's diagnosed with Bell's palsy. So, <laughs> so, so they wander into this town. This is Ceres, Texas. This will be the creepy, creepy town that's kind of stuck in time, but not really because they couldn't afford to do all old timey doors. I mean, it's, this is the most half-assed town stuck in time you can imagine, right? Oh, this is this. The time problem of this movie is so fucking glorious because it's very obviously whatever fucking remember the Alamo weekend renaissance fair, but Cowboys Westworld wannabe thing Chuck Norris signed up to do. Yes. Like autograph set for the weekend. And he was like, I'll tell you what, I'll knock a hundred dollars, which is all you're paying me off that price. If you let me shoot a movie here with my son. And they were like, sold. <laughs> yes. Right, and and it's so half, it's done so half-assedly that they only kind of allude to that in the movie. Yeah, right, because nobody has a phone and all the technologies. But but you know, sometimes there's a car. You got that shortwave. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Back in the days of shortwaves and you know cars with fins. <laughs> what? <laughs> that it is funny. Explain to me what technology is acceptable and not. Why is a shortwave okay? Very unclear. And a <laughs> phone is no, no, no. We can't have phones here. Also, I noticed the car that ends up being introduced does have plates on it. It oh. does have. <laughs> <laughs> so they're registered. It has Texas plates. Yes. <laughs> look, look. The law is the law. Dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that was bizarre. We're a satanic cult, sure, but you still got to register. Right. Cards. So that lady had to go to a different, <laughs> larger town in order to get plates. Yes. Because there's no DMV in that town. Right, there's not satanic a DMV. DMV. We're not <laughs> sovereign <laughs> citizens here. We take it seriously. Now I want to watch the satanic DMV, though, where everyone's right. just chalkily <laughs> staring into the middle distance. Do not touch the children. <laughs> you will need to spend $80 to register. <laughs> okay. Speaking of touching the yes. children, yes. can we talk about the worst plot point that ever happened that starts right The here? meat cute? I oh, Thank you, Noah. I have a fan theory. Oof. Fan theory. This was supposed to be, yeah, this was supposed to be a grown woman. This little girl part. And at the last minute, she dropped out because she couldn't be within 25 feet of Mike Norris. And they were like, we'll just use a girl child instead and cut the smooching scene. And that is how this movie makes sense. Isn't that Chuck Norris's granddaughter? It yeah. is. It is, right? <laughs> yeah, who plays Lyric. Yeah, the ly Lyric is played by Chuck Norris. We got more than three Norrises hanging out in this film. Yeah, Ew. yeah. Also, uh, A.R. White's wife is uh, Chuck Norris's <laughs> daughter-in-law or course, something. Of yeah. course, yeah. No, Another Andrea, Norris. No, we know we know A.R. White's wife pretty well. I, 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 we would have recognized her. I'm sorry. I, I'm going to have to call you on that one. <laughs> oh, no, no. In the movie. In, in the, the movie. movie. 
Oh, 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 right. Okay, I got you. I got you. The guy, oh, guy. It's not Andrea Logan White. Yeah, right. No, Andrea Logan White. We know it. Come on, I didn't I, pretend I, to tell you yeah, the no. white. <laughs> <laughs> we do that on our show. Uh, yeah. How did you guys like being on God Awful Movies? It was okay. There was like 30 minutes in. They stopped and yelled at us for a while about <laughs> David A. <laughs> White's family tree. They had a quiz. About how we don't know enough about his personal life. <laughs> yeah. We did badly. So, no, okay. So, but let me back up just a little bit for the audience here. So here's how this actually plays out. So Mike Norris's character, of course, he lost the little girl. In, in, in the movie's universe, we're pretending that wasn't intentional and, and it was an accident. Yeah, he's a murderer. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but in the universe where he's not, he walks up onto this porch, sees this little girl staring at a gumball machine as, as though she's trying to, like, you know, burn a hole in it with her eyes. And he buys her a gumball. First of all, don't do that shit to kids. You don't know if that kid's diabetic or something. Fuck, Jesus, don't give other people's kids candy. <laughs> but then secondly, he plays it like he's falling in love. Yes. It's really creepy. It's super creepy, yeah. Like, Mike Norris is apparently not a good enough actor to not play this like, I want to fuck this little kid. <laughs> and what's more jarring is that she's playing it right. Yeah. She's, she's acting like, uh, sort of innocent little child. Which is why it's <laughs> ten times creepier the way yes. he's acting. Yes. Yes. Yeah, She's not being standoffish at all. She's like, oh, it's I'm unnerving. Open. Yeah. <laughs> also, who's maintaining that gumball machine? <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's still a guy who comes around to pick up the change. The yeah. satanic overlords are having a dark meeting and they're like, we need, we need more to double order bubble. more refills. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> They have satanic dry storage. That means it's all, it's so, yeah, so much. All right, Lyric, you can have your one gumball every 10 years. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, right. So, okay, so meanwhile, the gang goes into this old timey saloon with a perfectly modern closet door and napkin dispensers. It's so weird. <laughs> and this is where we learn that this is a dry county. There's no beer. And also that Mike Norris is a raging alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> right, like everywhere he goes in this movie, I'll be like, "Is there beer here? Is there a chance to do a product placement for? Um, <laughs> <laughs> is it Lone Star? No, it isn't. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, Shiner Bach. Yeah, it's Shiner Bach, I <laughs> believe. <laughs> that and Deja Blue clearly paid for uh, <laughs> product placement. <laughs> It worked. I'm drinking a uh, Deja Blu right now. <laughs> well, there, you go. there you go. Yeah, nailed it. Yeah, and then so they're they're in the saloon. They find out that there's no phones in this town, and they also find out that there's no auto parts store from Chuck Norris. Da -da. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. And can we take a moment to talk about Chuck Norris's appearance in this movie? Wig. This is not <laughs> wig. Yet. We this just not... took a moment. The end. It's done. <laughs> wig. <laughs> but he's also bedraggled and yep. tired. Look, he looks like he's just gotten over a bad flu <laughs> throughout the film. Yeah, he looks like like his, his like his son tricked him into this one, right? Yeah. This, is, this is not Walker Texas Ranger so much as it's crawl over to the toilet Texas Ranger. <laughs> he may have lost a bet or something. Yeah, right, right, exactly. He's like, ah, I can't drink like I used to. Fine, I'll be in your fucking movie. All right. <laughs> so yeah, and and then he's like, but you know, the, I, I I don't know about no phone, but I do know where you might be able to find a shortwave radio, and they're like. Well, that's fucking weird. Okay, where? But he, he walks out, so they all have to leave without fucking get their drinks or paying for anything because it's a stupid movie. Yeah, fuck you. Now that waitress has to avoid the drinks. Yep. She has to get a manager card. In the <laughs> it's busy at the time. It's packed, except it is packed. Come on. She gets the manager card from Satan. <laughs> I do I do like the way that they exit the restaurant, though, because there's the cut of Chuck Norris walking out very calmly. And yeah. then it just does this really harsh jump cut to them like Scooby doing out of yeah. the restaurant <laughs> right. where they <laughs> jump out of those tables as what? fast as they possibly Wait, can. Shortwave? Whoa, there's a shortwave. We got to go, guys. <laughs> <laughs> also, so he the Chuck tells them to go find this lady yes, who will take yes, them to the yeah, shortwave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then, spoiler alert, she takes them to Chuck Norris's house. <laughs> yeah, yes. He's playing games. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. Yeah, he just vaguely drags out this plot constantly. We're going to find out he's a good guy. Yeah, it makes... There's no reason that he couldn't have no. just been like, come over to my place, guys. I got a short Yeah, way. follow me. I have a horse. Or at the least, like, hey, this woman has a car, so we can get you to a car, and <laughs> right. she can get you there. Not yeah. like, I know a woman. 
who knows where the short <laughs> yeah. radio is to be found. She can help you solve the riddle. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. that's right. Oh, yeah, get yeah, into exactly. my house. The peacock <laughs> flies at midnight. What does that mean, man? Just, are we going to your house for the radio? Just say the thing. When I get to her Fuck. house, is she going to ask me to gather three herbs from the fucking countryside? Because <laughs> this is stupid. So, okay. All right, so they show up at this house that Chuck Norris was telling them about, and, and a beautiful young woman answers the door. If you're thinking to yourself, oh, that must be the love interest, then you're thinking more about this movie than the people who wrote it, right? Mm -mm. <laughs> no, no, that's a child. Yeah. So, But she reluctantly agrees to take them to the shortwave radio. She has to drive them there because, of course, it's at Chuck Norris's house. We don't know that yet. But this is also where we meet her creepy kid. I and this kid could not be more boring or uninterested in the film. Yeah, I need so many more action movies to involve this shitty kid. <laughs> for, I think, for the role that that kid is playing, he killed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think mean, it led to. I think it led it. to the one genuine comic moment I remember is in the in the movie in the back of the car. The Orin comic relief asshole is like, "You like football?" And the kid has a really good delivery of no. <laughs> yep, it's pretty fantastic. <laughs> and then they just move on. Like, we didn't need that, but it did work. Yeah. <laughs> also, by the way, while they're driving over to Chuck Norris's house, they go three deep in that back seat. Yes. With the kid in the middle. <laughs> yeah. There's no way that they didn't touch they that kid. They touched that kid. Yeah. Yeah. They had yeah. to have touched him. Uh, they touched the, they shit, touched out the shit out of that kid. Uh, so, <laughs> so, meanwhile, so while they're heading out over there, we, we check in with these the two dark, old, satanic white guys of the film. We have to meet. These are our two prote our antagonists, each other. Okay, why does this movie have two bad guys? It, it never. There's never a reason for it. It never makes any sense. But we have to cut over to their like dimly lit, candle lit, evil black walled layer so that they can stand there and talk about the plan that they both know about to each other for a minute. Yeah. How did you guys imagine the hierarchy went between the two of them? This, I feel like this is a co-manager situation because they're very <laughs> clearly dictating the plan to someone they think they are in charge of yeah. and they're both doing it. <laughs> but Beard Guy's doing the power move thing. He's got a chair that's slightly higher yep. and he yep. placed the like weird one candle so you can't really see anything. <laughs> and he's speaking in weird bad poetry the whole time. I feel like he's yeah. he's the regional manager. This guy's like a lower level like, okay. you know, floor salesman. Of Satan. See, now now the way that I have to read it, though, is because when we find out that Emeritus, great, again, the names in this movie, mm -hmm. perfect. Bearded fella. Uh, bearded yep. fella, <laughs> 90 years ago or whatever. 180. 19, 180 years. So that's yeah. right. 180 <laughs> years ago. Okay. <laughs> we see the other guy appear in like a vision to him. Is the co-manager appears in a vision to the child before yeah. he turns evil. So so the co-manager I read as actually Satan. He's it's the one who's actually running everything behind the scenes cuz he didn't age. Ooh. All right. See what I'm saying? All right. Yeah. Yep. That's my theory on that. Yeah. I can't make heads or tails of it. I, nope. I, I think you're right about who's in charge here though, but we'll get we'll get to that. I, I feel like you know, look at this point in the movie, there's still all the promise in the world that this is going to tie together and make sense. And and I feel like the audience may still be clinging to that hopeful illusion. Is there? So we're going to pause for another no, break, but we're going to be back not. soon with even more of the Bells of Innocence. Welcome to Typically Shady Sex Shop at a nearby strip mall. Would that be all for you, sir? Uh, yeah, I'll take these two and then I'd like this stuff for free. <laughs> sir, we don't just give you free stuff here. In fact, we charge everything as an insane markup because we hope you're going to be too embarrassed to put anything back. Wait, wait. So where did you get the idea that we were going to give away free stuff? AdamandEve.com. What's AdamandEve.com? Seriously? Well, I, I'm here in the sex shop. Oh, yeah? I have questions. You're here in the sex shop? Yeah. What are you shopping for, Heath? I'm, I am getting a... a I, I, you know what? Never mind. I'm not in the sex shop. It's fine. That's what I thought. AdamandEve.com is the number one adult toy superstore. Oh, yeah? What makes them so great? Well, they started as a master's thesis in family planning. They were the first mail-order contraceptive business in America, and they're LGBTQ and sex work positive. Oh, that, that actually is pretty great. Yeah, and when you use our code AWFUL at checkout, you can select almost any one item for 50% off. And then Adam and Eve loads on the free stuff. Hey, what kind of free stuff? A cock ring, a vibrator, and a lube sample, plus six free pornos. Wow, that's a lot of free stuff. 
It sure is. Plus, there's free shipping. Wait, what's that code again? That's awful. A-W-F-U-L. Offer code awful at checkout at adamandeve.com for 50% off almost any one item and a bunch of free stuff. All right, sir. That actually sounds pretty good. Hey, what do you think my friend was here to buy? I mean, it was books. It was books. I was buying books about woodworking. At the sex shop? Yes. That that's why I left. I didn't have any books about woodworking. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. No problem, ma'am. Yeah, however we can help. Jonathan, come in and say hi to the nice men. Whatever, mom. Go. Listen, I hate you. we don't have much time, but what I need you, you to do. Know do you have is- some games on your phone? Uh no, sorry. Can I see it real quick? My phone? I Let just, me just told- see real- I just told you. Whatever. Right. Um. So this town, it's filled with Satan worshippers, and their unholy right is to spill the blood <laughs> of. He said, "Hole." Jonathan. What? You're such a bitch. Whoa, whoa, kid! Don't call your mom a bitch. You don't even know her. I'm going to my room. Anyway, um, I was hoping you would take Jonathan with you to save him from human sacrifice. Not a chance. Yeah, actually, that might. I, I might help. That's two votes for helping for me. <laughs> <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit. We're going to rejoin the gang still riding from Diana's place over to the short rave radio where, of course, this, this is going to be Chuck Norris's house. Right? <laughs> they show up and they're like, hi, we met moments ago. You did a riddle about a radio or something. <laughs> Can you just give it to us directly? We mysteriously <laughs> had a Bible from our downed plane. And yeah. <laughs> now you've made us go through over the hills and grandmother's house to your house for the radio. <laughs> and within five seconds, Jux is like, can I have a beer? Yeah, right. Please. Yeah. <laughs> Someone get me a fucking beer. <laughs> oh, and riddles and bullshit. I need a Shiner Bob. <laughs> And we just watch Chuck Norris in real life. There's no acting here. Just disappointedly watch Mike Norris chug a beer. (laughs) (laughs) This is the fucking, this is pre boyhood boyhood, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) Yeah, but he's like, yep, there's my shortwave radio that I just keep set up in my living room right there just in case of a moment like this, right? Yep. And luckily for him, uh, while he's flying the Bibles to Mexico, David A.R. White's wife just sits by the shortwave radio the whole time. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just moving dials. Yeah, like a good Christian wife does. What yeah. are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. Have just, you not read the Bible, sir? Just scanning the frequencies, <laughs> trying to find. See, I really wanted this SOS call to interrupt her having phone sex with a trucker somewhere. And she's just like, oh, no, I was just, I was just sweeping. <laughs> breaker, breaker, fuck. Okay. Hello, <laughs> husband. Yeah, so he gets her on the line and he's like, wife, wife, our plane crashed. We're okay. We're in Ceres, Texas. Hello, hello. And then the whole thing goes out, right? Because that would solve the goddamn movie if that didn't happen. What's so amazing is they make it with no interruption or static at all through small talk for six minutes. And then he's like, we're in and the radio dies. (laughs) Right. But it, I mean, it, it's kind of a plot contrivance that doesn't matter. Like, that town doesn't exist, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're like, Ceres hasn't existed for a million years. Right, right. right. My like, daughter died 30 years ago. Okay, well, night. then how do you get a fucking shortwave radio? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then we get Davy's wife. She's on the phone trying to rustle up some help for him. And I love that her reaction, because apparently she knows the plot. Her reaction isn't, oh, I must have misheard him. There was a lot of static. Mm-hmm. Right? No. No. Her reaction is like, oh, man, they got sucked into a demon town, didn't they? (laughs) Oh, God, this movie was too good. We don't deserve a movie this good. Okay, so now Diana is going to take the gang to a hotel so that they can stay in the creepy hell town longer. (laughs) Okay. I just want to point out, and again, you guys watched this movie collectively 18 more times than I did. Mm -hmm. This hotel through all the creepiness that they will introduce in this scene, never matters. Nope. (laughs) Not once. It's just a hotel. It might as well be a fucking Motel 6. Right, which means that when the guy who gives them their room keys is like, you're lucky we've got three rooms left. In the world of this movie was just like, I feel like I came on too strong. I should just be like, (laughs) 
I made that weird. I made that weird. Why do they have a fucking hotel? <laughs> yes, right. They don't what? have anything else. This is where we get into like, is everybody in the town in on it or not? Because right. otherwise, there's no reason for this hell hotel owner to be so creepy. But like, we have three rooms I think, available. I think he so. might just be a weirdo. He thinks it's Could funny. Could just be a weirdo. Yeah. 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 All right. The hotel's just full of missionaries who try to break Bibles. <laughs> yeah, like, after the scene, he goes, he goes to the other non-bar and he's talking to his buddies like, man, I did my creepy hotel guy uh, thing and it killed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, scared. Right. <laughs> There's nothing in that town that appears to be a tourist location. No. They're hostile to outsiders. Right. So it only seems like they'd have a hotel for people to have affairs at, like in yeah. the town. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> well, but it's like 206 <laughs> people. So like, I mean, they're going to know. Yeah. It's fucking amazing that there's no point. Like you got to figure the guy's like, man, you know, I had anybody in here since Amelia Earhart. This guy, I was thinking I was going to go to a different fucking business, but you know what? Normally we rent by the hour. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, but they're going to go check into their rooms. Then we watch Mike Norris settle into his hotel room. Why would we watch that? <laughs> Why would you show us that? He lays on his bed with his shoes on like some kind of asshole. That's a hotel bed. Amelia Earhart has to sleep there. <laughs> oh, I wanted him to call down to the front desk and ask if they have a revolver they can loan him for his pre bedtime <laughs> Russian roulette. I was going to say, I'm furious he doesn't bring his gun with him. What if he's got an overnight stay somewhere? Okay. If you've got an overnight stay, you bring your toiletries. And for him, his morning routine is a gun. Yeah. I don't understand. <laughs> he opens up the nightstand. It's just a Gideon Bible and a gun. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know exactly. Okay. There you go. <laughs> okay. They got the Juck special at this hotel. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> He's got a heads and tails it with a toaster and a bathtub to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> is it plugged in or is it not? We'll find out. <laughs> One more day. <laughs> One more day. <laughs> All right. So he lays there being haunted by creepy whispers for a little while. And then he goes off to track down Gumball Girl. Yeah, that was, that was unsettling. Yeah, that's not cool. So oh, God. So, yeah. So we have a longer meet cute between the two of them where he tells her how pretty she is. And she says he looks like her suicidal dad. <laughs> yeah, she yeah. has an interesting backstory that she tosses off very quickly. Just yeah. Like, oh, yeah. My dad killed himself. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we also learn here that her name is Lyric, which is fucking weird. I feel like Jux Jonas just didn't want to have the dumbest name in the movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's a reference to Cyril, which is a scramble, a jumble of ly Lyric. Cyril of Alexandria with the devil's uh, right theology writer. Okay. <laughs> sure. That's probably, it. that's probably it. I'm sure that's what Mike Norris was thinking. I'm sure that's what Mike Norris uh, was This movie's deeper than everybody thinks. I'm just which, saying. which one of us becomes Ogre in Revenge of the Nerds right now and screams How? at you? How? <laughs> 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 All right, now 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 do that letter rearranging trick with Jux. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A uh, Jux. Uh, oh god, you know that's just that's a losing at Scrabble moment right there. Yeah. <laughs> and then we go back to the fucking saloon where Oren is trying out his peacock joke again with the town's folks. Oh, he's he's just yelling at everyone in the bar for not getting the punchline. Yeah. It's fantastic. It's a good joke. You got to tell it. Cyril of Alexandria. Cyril of Alexandria. You'll see a peacock's going to be in this movie later, and he's going to think it's fucking great. Yes. Read a fucking book by Cyril of Alexandria. Representation. They weren't surprised when there was a real peacock. No. no. They no, it was. Been. Yeah. That would be something very surprising for that region at that time of year. Yeah. <laughs> and for people who have been talking incessantly about peacocks. It would be a coincidence at least. Yeah. yeah. That makes me mad. I think they'd mention it. So, okay. So now we have, have a, we have to have one of the several trying and failing to touch a child scenes. Right. So this is where David A.R. White is standing out in front of the church and he sees this family there and he's like, hey, guys, can I touch a kid? No. Weird. <laughs> okay. If I can get a little meta for a moment, what happens in this movie is they are doing something, something to the kids and they can never be touched by outsiders. 
that will not be revealed until 14 seconds before the end of the movie. Yeah. So this movie is just our main characters walking around being like, let me rub, let me give your kid a back rub, and then being like, it's weird <laughs> that they said no to that, right? Yeah. The, the problem is that, yeah, they don't let the audience in on the meaning of like the touching of the children being like, it'll protect them from demons or whatever. Right. And yeah. everybody in the town is out, like, if you don't have that information, is acting incredibly appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, totally. yeah, yes. <laughs> when the parents pull their kid away from David A.R. White, it's like, well, that's reasonable. That's oh, fine. Oh, this weirdo blonde stranger <laughs> yeah. wandered into town and wants to start fucking around with our kids? Yeah. Get the fuck out of right, here, and, man. And we know these guys are from a church, so they're way more likely to be pedophiles than normal, right? Yeah. Right? <laughs> that isn't even, like, that doesn't even enter into no, it no, necessarily. It like, it's it's just weird. like I was trying to think about this like I was using this as a mental exercise if I showed up in a town mm -hmm. and I was a stranger how long would it take me to realize that people were weird about me touching their kids like uh, yeah. giving them a high, <laughs> high five or a handshake <laughs> I would never find out you'd never find out <laughs> yeah <laughs> But right. I wouldn't try to high five these kids, or if they didn't high five me, I wouldn't take it personally. I think it was straight. Maybe All that's right. big game of hug tag. Let's go hug tag, everybody. No, maybe that's maybe that's a, a rolling bet that they all have. All three of these guys just fly around to different towns, and they're like, "Okay, how creepy can you be before we find out something's wrong with the children? Yeah. <laughs> how that, long does it take?" That scene's in the director's yeah. cut. <laughs> I hate playing this game. Jeffrey always so wins. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So meanwhile, of course, Mike Norris is still flirting with his 10 year old. This is where he puts her up in a tree. She's wearing a skirt. Oh, God, I don't like this scene at all. She says, was your daughter pretty? And he says, she was pretty just like you. I was backing away from this mm -hmm. movie like a tarantula at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's real creepy. <laughs> Yeah, right. No, because at this point, there has been zero indication that these two are not the love interests of the film. There's, it, I can't imagine the people making this movie not recognizing like the problems right? that are so like in your face with this structure and <laughs> yeah. set up. It's very, it's very bizarre. Yeah. And the lines are written so that they come off way creepier than they need to be. Yeah. Mm. Every, every, yeah. Like, oh, uh, this kid is super gorgeous. And you're like, I did, you didn't need to say it like that. <laughs> you could have said it differently. Right. You can <laughs> rewrite a movie. You don't have to like just, oh, well, we put it down. So we got to film it. <laughs> well, and that's the most amazing thing, right? Because I can almost see like if you, you write it and then you don't realize just what a creepy fuck Mike Norris is and how much he's going to play that like he wants to bone this kid. Right. But once you realize that, yeah, you could rewrite his lines and you could make him like say like, I think you're platonically pretty or something. <laughs> but yeah. So anyway, so she falls out of the tree and he catches her. And just then her uncle shows up. Her uncle is the MVP of the film, by the way. Yes. I, have a, I have a, love her uncle. I have a hunch. Love him. I have a hunch that's not really her uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Look, here's all I'm gonna say. If I ever walk outside of my house and find that someone is holding my child cradle style, I am also going to fist fight that person. <laughs> Yeah. So the the uncle is like dragging Lyric away from Norris. Right. Mm -hmm. And he's being a bit abusive, honestly. He's put yeah. he's tugging. Super abusive. Yeah. Well, he slaps yeah. her at one point. Yeah. Yeah, because she's like, he's my friend. Exactly. And then uh, the uncle hits her. And then Mike Norris punches the dude and then he choke slams him. Yeah. <laughs> None of this is Mike Norris's business. No. None Go away, <laughs> Mike Norris. You are not supposed to be here, jucks. And, and the problem that I have is knowing what we know at the end of the movie, that Lyric is basically a demon, she's orchestrated all of this totally. in order to right. manipulate Mike Norris, jucks, into thinking of her as his own child uh -huh. or whatever. So she did this and tricked yeah. her fake uncle into having this confrontation where in order to elicit this reaction from Jux, he had to hit her. Right. And then he she kills the uncle. It's so weird. Yeah, man. the uncle has oh. the most complete narrative arc to me. Because <laughs> right, yeah. Here's how we, we meet her uncle. He's mm -hmm. like, hey, I need to protect this girl who, whether or not he knows that she is a literal demon, is up for grabs. So then he does that. Then he hits Lyric for some reason, which uh, if he does know she's a demon, mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. No, I think I think that was part of her plan. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. So then she kills him or forces him to hang himself. Right. 
Mm -hmm. And we never deal with the fact that he has super strength. Nope. Which kind of suggests that he is also a demon. So why do you got to kill him? Right. Yeah. What can you kill the demons by hanging them? Yeah. Right. He had to have an accident because he hit her. Yeah. That's what that's what they imply. Right. Yeah. Wild. She put a she put a noose in his nightstand. He woke up and he was like, you know what? All right. <laughs> one of six. One of six. Huh? You can't. Yeah. You can't Russian roulette with a noose. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> I guess not another day for me. All right. I put six of them together. That didn't. No. <laughs> oh. So, and then Davey, okay, so when the uncle choke slammed Mike Norris, he knocked him the fuck out. So Davey comes across Jux just laying unconscious on the ground in town. And he's like, hey, man, um, I can think of no good situations that lead to this. So, <laughs> you get, you get hey, were slammed? you trying to touch a kid again? Because <laughs> yeah, right. this seems like a reasonable result of that circumstance. Yes. But that's what he says. That's what Juck says. He's like, yeah. so I'm flirting with this girl. And her uncle yeah. gets all fucking angry. It I don't does know. sound like he's saying I'm talking. He's like, I'm he chatting said, I met this girl. A girl. Yeah, I met a girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The language that they use is not appropriate for the situation. <laughs> no, not even I close. met this hottie by the gumball machine. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, but here's the fucked up thing, right? Because Mike Norris says, I was talking to this girl and then Oren interrupts uh, them. And he's like, hold on, hold on, man. I want to hear about the little girl he was telling me about. So like David A.R. White's character knows Norris well enough to know that when he says, I met a girl, he's talking about a fucking 10 year old. A right? child. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, we're getting off track. Try, it doesn't. The age doesn't matter. This guy picked me up with one hand and choke slammed me. <laughs> yeah, can you believe that? He's definitely way too used to Mike Norris's behavior. David R. White's like, yeah, you tried to befriend a child again, and an adult beat you up for it. And he's like, you tried to befriend a child again. I wanted to doodly do her a flashback where that happens across several different <laughs> towns. <laughs> no, no, no. And it is, it is getting to a disturbing pattern of behavior where if Jux's backstory was that he had killed a lot of his daughters, I would kind of believe it. <laughs> there you go. Or, or if the girl that he pushed into traffic wasn't his daughter, right, it was, it was someone hard. else's daughter. Who he exactly, he just met her. Yeah. <laughs> His wife was leaving him because he killed somebody else's daughter. Yeah. That makes way more sense. Yeah. <laughs> if he won this movie by pushing Satan as a little girl into traffic oh, in front of Diana Starr, yeah, wow. there you go. Oh, Jesus Christ. So, yeah, but so, and this is the most baffling fucking combination of sentences ever in a movie. Mike Norris is telling what happened. He's like, yeah, so anyway, I ran into a guy that has superhuman bad guy strength. He threw me through a wall. Anyway, I'm going to go back to the hotel, take a little nap. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. You shouldn't do that, man. You might have a concussion. <laughs> right. <laughs> that is super bad for your long-term health. <laughs> I mean, this is Jux. David R. White has both fingers crossed, and he's like, concussion, concussion, concussion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this movie makes more sense as if the second half is all just Jux dealing with CTE. Like that's, <laughs> then I'm like, okay, I can see yeah, how that, right, would, right, yeah. that would happen. Yeah, I get you. He did murder his daughter. Right? <laughs> so... So yeah, so it's, oh, oh, and all this time when they're talking about like there's something wrong with this town, we should get out of here. We, there's a guy who's right behind the tree listening to them, <laughs> and a foot away. Yeah, this guy yeah, he, could not be hit. Happening. Could not be hit by that entire tree. Yeah, no way. He doesn't, he, he doesn't close. Fit. <laughs> this guy's getting more and more obvious throughout the movie, and it's, yes. it was hilarious by this point. Yes, yes, absolutely. He's like spy, spy, spy. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> He's holding up a newspaper with a hole cut in it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and just when you're thinking to yourself, man, the only thing that could make this movie better, honestly, is zombies. We cut to the old Satan guy summoning some fucking zombies. Okay. Arise. <laughs> arise, my dark denizens of the deep. And do nothing. Yes. yes. Right. And have no effect exactly. on the plot at all. Go. <laughs> Do reconnaissance for me. <laughs> Peek through a second floor window. I want to watch these zombies complain to Satan later about their job. They're like, I mean, he rose us from the dead literally to stand there with torches later. Uh, excuse me, dark one. Uh, 
He made us stand one on top of each other's uh, <laughs> shoulders to look in a second floor window looking for information that he could have got just by asking. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dave, what did we say? You would just ask and you wouldn't do the whole thing? Sorry, sorry I, could, I, I blanked on stuff to use the zombies for and they're only good for so long. <laughs> I, need, I really need you to read my emails as soon as they come in because this is happens a lot. It's like when you buy too much weed and so you smoke too much weed and then you realize that you've smoked too much and then you don't know where you should put the weed so you put it in the fridge and then it's too cold. I, don't, I freaked out. I freaked out. Okay. <laughs> Could we get rollover zombies so that I'm not so worried about using them? All right. So, yeah. So, we introduced some zombies just so they could look in Mike Norris's window for a minute. And then it's it's the next morning. And David A.R. White and, and Mike Norris are talking. They're like, you know, how'd you sleep? Oh, there's zombies in the window. You know, it's gonna, not great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and say it. Not great. <laughs> Isn't this their first night in the town? He says... I heard those strange noises again. Right. We haven't established that you heard them before. <laughs> it's true. You guys haven't talked about it. This is your first night there. <laughs> and Mike Norris reacts as though he's hearing this for the first time, despite the again being there. This movie desperately needed like a script supervisor. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's just like. <laughs> or a skeleton key. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I had this issue where you like I had no idea how long they'd been at the town in the town for any at any point could have been there a month could have been yep. there for four hours yeah. no clue I had I had no clue why they were still there <laughs> at various points they keep saying like we got to get out of this town and it's like there's no reason you can't leave <laughs> no one's stopping you there's they're not in a hurry either no. yes 360 degrees every one of them leads <laughs> out <laughs> yeah Jesus Christ. Jiffy Lube has a short rave wave rate. <laughs> it does have such a Scooby-Doo plot, though, because they're flying in the mystery van. Right. All right. It breaks down in some random town and they're like, well, we're just the kind of ragtag group of fellas to solve their problem. <laughs> yeah. Look at all these creepy people around. And it turns out it's the devil in the form of a child. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they Under take the, the kids yeah. and they take <laughs> Lyric's mask off and they're like, oh, it was old man the devil the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> old man and I would have gotten away with it if Mike Norris wasn't a pedophile. <laughs> <laughs> Foiled again. These damn kids wouldn't let us touch him. Fuck. <laughs> all right. So they're heading out for another day on the town. As they're leaving the hotel, Diana shows up, the girl who took him over to Mike Norris's house, and she says, hey, you guys meet me after some undetermined period of time has elapsed. I don't know why I'm not just asking you to get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and every character, all these characters check in with each other like, fuck stuff, right? This is a fuck, fuck stuff that, thing. She wants to do a lady. little roll okay. on the thing. All right. So. All right. All right, so we head back to the saloon where Oren's new buddy, the one that showed whose wrist we saw with the brand on it earlier, wants to learn football. We have this weird diversion into that for a few minutes. The entire reason for this scene is that it's impossible to teach children football without touching them. Yeah, the line reading there, because I... I the David, David R. White, A.R. White has. Yeah, yeah, where he's like, what do you, you can't teach these kids football. What do you want to wind up like Jux? The moment you touch a kid, you're going to get thrown on the ground or something like that. And you're like, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I guess. <laughs> now, the problem that I have with that is that at this point in the movie, they shouldn't be aware of the fact that Jux got beat up because he has touched... Lyric and therefore right. interfered with the devil's plan for yeah, souls. It's not the touching. No. They, know, they don't know anything about the touching yet. It's just him and Lyric specifically. Yeah. Well, and he punched the guy in the head before that dude yes, threw him. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I feel like that would be, you, you would think, you know, he probably threw me because I punched him in the fucking face. Yeah, their understanding of the situation should be, I accidentally got in the middle of a domestically yes. violent situation, yeah. an abusive uncle-niece relationship and a guy chokeslam me through a yeah. yeah, it should have been like I was poking my nose into other people's business in ways that were inappropriate. The touching part really shouldn't be no. anything that they pay attention to. No, no, it should not. But they're like, you can't. This is another town where you can't even touch a kid. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, this keeps happening. It's I kept, a mess. I, ke I kept reading in like this, this like this is the future liberals want kind yeah. of shit. Out of that. <laughs> yeah. You know what? If you go to a liberal town, you're not even going to be able to randomly touch strangers' right. kids. <laughs> is this what you want? This is cancel culture. Gone yeah. too far. <laughs> yeah. We showed up with a wooden box full of Bibles, and what do you know? They won't let us touch their kids. Right. 
They don't know that there's a cult at this point. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> no, nope. they didn't see the zombies no outside. Nope. They don't know that there's evil afoot. Not a goddamn thing. No, all they know is that the people creepily stare at them and like you're dressed and rightfully different so. Than, yeah. Rightfully so. The townspeople are not wrong. No. Right. So, okay. So meanwhile, so we cut the lyrics. She's in a big candly Satan room, pacing back and forth, talking to old man Satan words. Emeritus. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess they gave him that name because education is the devil. I no idea. No idea. He's a, re, he's a retired professor it's who retired. still teaches. Yeah, sometimes. that means retired. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Emeritus prep, professor of evil. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I have a question now. Is the plot of this movie at this point lyric? An independent demon, a freelance demon, is working on jocks, <laughs> while Emeritus, professor of demonology, is trying to work on like a town-wide Satan plan wow. with the help of the assistant to the regional manager. I hadn't considered yeah. that they could possibly be working at cross purposes from time to time. <laughs> Wait, so Emeritus is is not Satan, right? So she's right. Satan this whole time? I interpreted it as like she's actually the big bad guy. Right. She's yeah. she's actually in like over both regional managers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Cuz she has the she has the scene with Chuck Norris later on where yes. they're both like old but like in, it's in heat like they're they're yeah. okay well i'm on the <laughs> right. good side of the law and you're on the bad side right. of the law but we respect <laughs> each other for how hard we work at this job and she has she has the moment later like at the end of the movie in a dream sequence where she's like the catalyst of trying right, to ruin exactly. jux's faith uh, i think i think that she's actually the big evil yeah and that scene with her in the candle room is like legitimately where I was like, this movie is now interesting. Yeah, I was wrong, but that <laughs> yeah, right, right. But <laughs> no, like that was the that that was the closest to interesting that it ever got. But yeah, that but my takeaway was that that was like Satan incarnate or some high level demon taking the form of a little girl because they knew that would be Jux's weakness, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Exploit his pain and need for to feel a connection with a daughter again. Right, exactly. But they tell it so fucking wrong and sloppy <laughs> and. <laughs> dumb yeah we've just done this movie such a huge favor by <laughs> expressing that well and but once once you find out that lyric is evil and all that yeah i honestly think that she's acting incredibly well yeah. i think that she plays that role super well well i mean we're comparing her to david a.r white and i was gonna Mike say yeah. <laughs> that's fair and marshall Teague. well and in this in this scene emeritus doesn't seem to know that lyric is also a demon or because at one point he's like you should be careful. You've been touched too by the right. It's like, well, if she's a demon. Who the fuck cares? What? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't make. Why sense. Why is everybody freaking out? Also, she told Emeritus that she killed her uncle. Yeah, so like the <laughs> right. first half of this script does not know the second half of the script. They've never no. met. They're not related. Mm -mm. They just share names. There, there's so much of this shit doesn't make sense if you assume that she's the one actually behind everything. But mm. none of it makes sense if you don't assume that. So yeah. <laughs> It, it, it's it's wildly stupid. Speaking of which, we now have to cut over to Diana's place so that she, we can watch her feed her horses for 18 minutes and then get a pop scare. Bye, Emeritus. She's like, feeding my horse. Feed Hello, Diana. <laughs> feeding the horses? Yes. Right. Okay. Good talk. Does yes. this scene <laughs> imply that Emeritus is Diana's child's father? Yes. Okay, I couldn't tell if I was reading too much into it. So, actually, I think he's supposed to be... We haven't even met the other bad guy, really, in the movie, but I think he's supposed to be the other bad guy's son. The mayor? Yeah, the mayor. Yeah. I thought I thought Emeritus was the dad of Jeremy with Diana. That's what I'm saying. It's the other guy who's saying that, who's, who's talking about that later, the mayor guy who's talking about that later. Oh, okay. Um, well, yeah. that clearly might have missed that. Yeah. So, yeah, right, right. So, but we also, but we learned that like we're right on the eve, apparently, of Jeremy losing his soul in the ill-defined satanic ritual that the kids undergo at age 12, right? Yeah. So, okay. So, meanwhile, Davy and Mike are cool walking through town a little bit more, heading out to Diana's place to meet her for the fuck stuff. And they get there and she's like, look, please, we need to get out of this town. Please take my terrible, shitty son. I can't say why, but just take him with you. <laughs> yeah. My favorite part of the scene, she looks out the window at one point of her house. They go into the house. She looks out the window and she's like, bad guys are 
spying on us. They're they're right outside. And she like makes eye contact with one of them. And he's like, <laughs> oh shit. And he starts whittling a spear yes, as if yes. that would be inconspicuous. <laughs> whittle, he's like, whistle, just, whistle. Oh no, I've been whittle. made. <laughs> <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> Yeah, so the bad guys are surrounding the house. She starts to kind of half-assedly explain the plot, but not really. She's still being coy about the fucking plot. <laughs> yeah, so she she wants them to sort of get her kid out of town before he gets the mark of Satan that the guy has on his, his wrist, and then he's going to lose his soul. Right. Yeah. But she has the mark also. Yes. So she should not have a soul. Right. Right. But... Apparently, if you've lost your soul, you can later grow up and then team up with good guys in order to... Yeah, you feel bad about it. What does losing your soul <laughs> yes! mean in this? Exactly. <laughs> and and let me, let me give you this bucket of syrup. All of this is misdirection by a demon child who's actually the devil to get Mike Norris to shoot a guy later in the movie? Yeah. It's, well, somebody's gotta. <laughs> yes, that's the plot. <laughs> All right, so they're leaving Diana's place. They, they've got to go back to Matthew's house because he's the only other character. That's Chuck Norris's character. But on the way, they run into the kids playing satanic ring around the rosy. <laughs> yeah. They ran out of <laughs> creepy child games for these children to play <laughs> in the initial shot we have at them. So in the third shot, they're just like, okay, I'm wearing a ball gag and you're sitting on his shoulders <laughs> throwing DVD <laughs> copies of the the engagement at him. Go now. <laughs> My favorite line of this entire movie Good line. comes right there whenever she just appears. She, uh, Lyric is talking to them. <laughs> and then from the kids game is like, yes, Lyric, it's your turn to supplicate yourself before the Punisher. <laughs> <laughs> like no, no context for that. No just just like, oh no. yeah, you know, the normal games that we used to play <laughs> gotta go she's like all right gotta go punisher supplicate and, yeah, gotta and they're, like, the punisher. they're like yep that's 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 what should happen <laughs> yeah, right now sure. cool. we're gonna get out of here that was like a line that was said from off camera too yeah. so it's like it's clearly like, this is <laughs> yeah. like let's throw it in yeah yeah yeah. Make this town seem we'll weird. put some voice over and post yeah. we'll figure it out so the guys all meet up again and and they remind us that the plot vaguely involves them wanting to leave Right. Like, again, somebody goes like, man, we got to get out of this town. And then they just don't. They're not even smart enough to create some sort of like, oh, we tried to leave. But then this distracted us. What are they going to do? Ask to borrow somebody's car that it's already established they have and drive to a nearby <laughs> town, find help and then drive the car back with somebody else later on? What kind of insane person would think that that very reasonable series of events nah. would be the thing to do? No, nah, they're more like, hey, we got to get out of this town. But first... Let's rent an apartment. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. I'm going to sign a three-month lease little on this car first. Like, let me raise some, raise some chicken. We got to get the fuck out of here, but let's start a business. <laughs> yes. That we general gotta... store could be yeah. outdone easily. Yeah. <laughs> we'll start a Walmart uh, here. We'll start one where you're allowed to touch the kids. Everybody will yeah. love it. So... <laughs> So anyway, they're having this conversation, and then you remember the football thread? You were afraid we were done with that? No, not at all. The kid who wanted to learn football runs up to David A.R. White and Oren and says, hey, can you teach us how to play football? And, and David's like, what fucking genre is this? Or am I going to... Is that what I'm doing now? To be clear, you say a kid. That's not a kid. That's no, an adult. No, that's right. an adult. <laughs> yeah. 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 He runs up with a deflated basketball and he's like, tell us about the football. And then I swear this must have been improvised because David Ayer White blanches with terror at the thought. <laughs> he 100% oh, does. You see the soul leave his face. He got yeah. a tattoo instantly from that cult <laughs> because he was asked to explain football. I demand to see the making of this scene. Okay, David, so in this scene, you're describing football to one of the villagers. You think you can wing this one? Oh, yeah, sure thing. Sure thing. And action. So tell me, mister, what is the football? Uh, well, the first thing you're going to need to know is that this is a basketball. And what else? I, um, th There are... But, but, uh, th well, this is a, a basketball... Uh, okay, we're still rolling. We're still rolling. David, just explain what football is. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, food bowl is a place where you can put kibble or dog food, depending on... Still rolling. No, David. 
No! Football! Sorry. Okay, so a football... Well, I, I'm guessing that'd be some kind of warm water contraption they have at the spa. They put Epsom salts in it, maybe. Cut! Cut! David! Football. The sport. Football. Just describe oh, football. The sport. Okay, yeah, got it. Okay, yeah. Action. All right, so here's the thing about a foot job. So you're you going to Cut! Cut! We got what we need! Did I just win the movie? Yeah, man. You won the movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so meanwhile, fucking Jux, while they're doing this, Jux is getting a splinter out of Lyric's hand. So much touching. Lots of touching. Now, because we know that she's a demon and she's manipulating him, there's a layer of this that becomes like less creepy, but it's still creepy as hell. Yeah. yeah. Right. From, from her perspective, a little less creepy. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to find her. It's like, here's the weirdest part about this is I felt better. I was like, oh, well, she's the predator. She's a demon. She's the predator. Right. So this isn't a creepy situation for me at all. Right. She should be fucking with this guy. He's clearly a creep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. And so now, as though we hadn't gotten enough in this fucking movie, Marshall goddamn Teague shows up. Oh, now, he's ooh. another gam regular, most notably the star of Last Ounce of Courage. Where he played a town mayor, as he's going to play here. He's the mayor of Creepy Town, and he shows up to give him the, you know, we're not so creepy after all speech. <laughs> he shows up and he's like, I'm the mayor. We're not a satanic cult. And they're like, oh, we didn't. Okay. We didn't ask if <laughs> now. Now I kind of have <laughs> questions, though. The mayor says something that blows this whole movie wide open for me, which is that last year they held a rodeo, the 22nd annual rodeo. <laughs> And the kids were like, these guys are a creepy cult. I want to go to that rodeo that's held in this creepy ass town. Fuck this movie. Show me the demon town rodeo. That's a movie. And, and are you kidding me? me? Show me the satanic planning meeting where he was like, all right, what if someone comes to town? Let's have 22 rodeos just to keep our cover still going. <laughs> we, we, we need to, we got to, okay, okay, they're going, we're coming, we got to sell this lie, so we're going to make some flyers for we the have, 22nd rodeo. We have, a, we have a bull that's getting very old. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then he, so he's like, anyway, so totally not devil worshippers, if that was what you're thinking. And so speaking of which, would you like to come to our Harvest Festival where we will not sacrifice you to the Great Horned One? <laughs> Come on, you'll get to meet the town, have some delicious food, get burned in a giant wicker man. It'll be a good time. It'll be a good time. <laughs> yeah, this is this is one for one the wicker man with uh yeah, yeah. some overlap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so okay, but and then what's amazing is that okay, we've spent two thirds of this goddamn movie with everything being creepy and them going, We gotta get out of this town and Diana warning them and telling them there's a satanic cult and showing them the brand and all this other shit. So then we cut to that evening and Oren's like, you, so you guys wanna go to that harvest party that we're talking about? <laughs> And Davey and Mike are like, yeah, I mean, we might as well. We're, we're here. There's you know, no TV. And... Yeah, what else are you going to well, do? Yeah. <laughs> what else are we going to do? Look, I know that a character out and out told us that their child was about to be sacrificed and begged us to take it away from this godforsaken place. But what if they have pierogies? Well, yeah, but you got invited to a festival. You can't be rude. Right? That's one of the yes. other commandments. And, okay. And the mayor said that they're not that bad. Well, right. No, he did say they weren't a satanic cult. So, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's like when a northerner goes into a piggly wiggly and you have to pretend that there's food that you could possibly imagine eating in there. <laughs> like, oh, a big jar of pig's feet that you made yourself without any regulation. Yummers. <laughs> I might pick up some of this later. <laughs> All right. So, so now we cut to the party which is all the walls are draped in black. It's all candlelit. There is no joy or laughter anywhere. They walk oh. in, they're like, so the Harvest Festival, huh? It's pretty nice. Uh, what are festival. they harvesting? <laughs> I, didn't see any harvest. I didn't see any agriculture going on. It's at all. Zero desert. agriculture. We've seen one horse. Yeah. 
No, there's a couple of horses. Oh, no, there's the horse that Diana has, and then there's the horse that Chuck Norris has. Yes, but right, that's an right. angel horse. Yeah. That doesn't count as a yeah, real right, horse. Yeah, right, exactly. Sure. So. Chuck Norris is... An, the angels don't, like, get a new horse every 10 years. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> All right, so, and then they, they show up at the party, and Marshall Teague shows up, and he's like, hey, drink some of this red liquid that I'm handing you. Have red liquid, everybody. <laughs> drink red liquid. Really wanted Mike Norris to grab it and just start shooting it. Nope, Mike Norris, one for every... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, he's dead. <laughs> I've got to be honest. I have never heard a children's choir sing through creepy burlap sack masks quite that well. Yeah, it was that, not bad. that was oh. really good, good singing. Really good. <laughs> Which again implies that part of the satanic cult's plan is a children's performance. Right? No, they had to rehearse this. Obviously. Totally. And not just that, either that or the demons are like, well, what, what, we're just going to play bad music for them? Yeah, come, come on. on. It's the Harvest <laughs> Festival. <laughs> be rude. We're going to play, we're going to play our good children creepily singing music, right? Yeah. It's not about them. It's about us. Right. <laughs> and David A. R. Wright gets that big, like, it's Latin line in there yeah, where uh -huh. everybody's supposed to know, like, oh, one, he knows the Bible and two, it's about to get creepy. Yeah. <laughs> And I love to because they give the kids all these creepy ass masks so that, you know, we can hear the creepy kids singing and be looking at the creepy <laughs> masks. But instead of having them come out wearing the creepy masks, they show us all these adorable little munchkins and shit. And you're like, oh, they're going to sing. And then they put the creepy masks on. It doesn't work. I know how cute they are. Under those <laughs> now. Also, if those kids don't get their soul stolen until 12. Right. At, at, like some of those kids have to be like at a certain point, like, hey, uh. Why are we doing this? Yeah, most of them <laughs> appear to be under 12. Yeah, uh, excuse me. Excuse me. All the adults in my life entirely. This seems really off. Yeah. And I, this is all I've ever known. That's the children's entertainment. That's their Paw Patrol, man. <laughs> yeah, they right. fucking yeah. love Melty Face Steve. That's who they're all dressed yeah. as. All right. Well, that's fair. Bluey's got nothing on Melty Face Steve. So, yeah, but so, of course, as this music is going on, the, the punch is getting them progressively drunker and more drugged and shit, and they all pass out. And we very quickly get them all, I guess, being tempted by the devil each individually in like a spinny room scenario. Oh. <laughs> so like, you know, we see Mike Norris and the devil's going like, you will get a new daughter, a better daughter. And then we see Davy and the devil's like, um, I won't abduct your wife and kid that we introduced <laughs> earlier. That was, that was a good offer, though. Yeah, that was right. Nice. No, yeah. that's when, when you can't refuse. And then they cut to Oren, and I'm just like, oh, please tell me that the Satan's going to, like, offer to, like, like get people to get his jokes or something like that, you know? <laughs> the Saints will win the Super yeah. Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> but they ran out of shit. Satan's like, oh, you also have a wife and kid that we haven't introduced yet, but you're, they'll, well, I'll abduct them, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get them. <laughs> so fucking stupid all right well given the more or less voluntary nature of their captivity i feel like we should let them suffer there for a bit so we're gonna take another quick break but first let me give act three the hard sell will the gang make it to safety in time why the fuck would they have gone to that party if the goal was to trick them shouldn't the town have a no creepy staring policy find out the answers to these questions and less when we return for the baffling conclusion of the bells of innocence and then if we get 500 new patrons, Heath has to get a tattoo of my face nope. on his face. Eli, we are not getting face tattoos for Matreon this year. I didn't say we. I said Heath. Hey, hey fellas. So what do you think? Oh, that's a, a nice T-shirt. Heath, is, is, is it new? <laughs> sure is new. I figured we needed to, you know, cool things up around the office a bit. So boom, baby, got this thing. It's the Budweiser frogs, right? Remember, like Bud, he, he, Wise. He, if you want to up your style game, why don't you try Cuts Clothing? What's Cuts Clothing? They've taken a classic men's fashion staple, the plain tee, and refined it, combining premium quality with a minimalist aesthetic. The end result, what GQ magazine calls the only shirt worth wearing, the signature buttery soft Pika Pro Tri-Blend Tee. It's a bold new take on a classic design, combining the ultimate blend of high-quality cotton, polyester, and spandex. Ooh, I love Tri-Blend. That does sound really nice. But uh, what if it doesn't fit? Yeah, uh, Heath's Budweiser shirt seems a little snug. I have I, I have I mean. a wide rib cage. Is well, what it's snug. Yeah, that's why though. Each piece of clothing is designed with custom engineered fabric, expertly graded for the perfect fit, arming you for every challenge and opportunity. 
Wow, that does sound good. But where do we get these awesome shirts? Also, is it just a lifestyle? It's not just a lifestyle. It's not just clothing. It's office leisure apparel for the sport of business. Huh. Get 15% off your first order by going to cutsclothing.com slash gam. That's cutsclothing.com slash gam for 15% off the only shirt worth wearing. All right, Noah, I am in. Later, Budweiser frogs. Hello, Care Bears. Uh, he, I, I, don't, I don't think they have the Care Bears on the cut shirts. Are you sure? Pre- pretty sure, yeah. I am pretty sure, yes. Who? Lord Satan. The Dark Wonder. Yes, minions, minions. Listen, soon I will give you control over this town and all its people. You shall be their lord and guide, and they will do your bidding. Sorry, um, who, who are you talking to, my lord? Yeah. Oh, um, both, both of you? Both of us? Like, yeah. we're co-satanic managers of this village? Co-satanic managers, yeah, I guess. Uh, well, you know, uh, spoiler, you seem to be some kind of bad demon Chuck Norris enemy, and you there, you're like a, a little boy turned into an old guy by Satan magic, right? Yeah, he's got us there. Yeah, that's true, I am. Right. So, uh, you know, just work it out and uh, make sure you lure Mike Norris with a little girl. The two of you. Got it. Got it. Heard and heard. Great. So, uh, bad guy plan over an open flame? Over an open flame, yes. This is going to be so fun. So fun. And we're back for still more of this shit. We're going to open up this act with a four second scene of, I guess, Oren and Davy's wives failing the Bechdel test in record time. <laughs> <laughs> it's the whole scene. We just see the two wives going like, hope they're OK. End of scene. <laughs> there are absolutely no positive interactions with women at all in this entire movie. No, yep. not once. Even when Diana goes to ask Chuck Norris for help, he's like, Hey, fuck off. I can't yeah. do shit yeah. for you. Get out you. of here. <laughs> right. Go away. I'm a watcher. Yeah, exactly. The only female who passes the Bechdel test is actually Satan the whole time. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> right. 100%. <laughs> All right. But the guys wake up. They're in prison now. They're in Satan prison. <laughs> Mm-hmm. David A.R. White is like, he's stuck in his like spinny poison dream thing. And he's like, I invoked the power of Jesus. I'm free. And then immediately they cut to him in a jail cell, which I thought was actually really funny. Yeah. Jesus can't handle that shit. Fucking chariots of <laughs> iron right here. But my favorite moment here is they wake up in the jail. David A.R. White stands up and shakes the door to the jail as though it's just going to come loose in his hands. And then... Mike Norris tries to. <laughs> right? He's like, you didn't shake it. You got to shake it better. You got to up and down it a bit. I relate I relate to that. I, I think if I ever found myself in that situation where I just woke up in this jail cell, just to, just to feel what it would be like, I'd probably shake the jail cell. <laughs> <laughs> it's a moment. It, maybe it's the old-timey jail version of pushing the elevator button again. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can see the light. <laughs> you know you it's not going to do again. anything. <laughs> when am I going to get another chance to do this? Somebody give me a, somebody give me a tin cup. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think Jux will find himself in many more jail cells by, yeah, the, right. uh, by the end of his lifetime. <laughs> Jux will have another chance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, but once they realize they can't just push the door open, Chuck, we see Chuck Norris off in the distance somewhere invoking his telekinesis to open the door for them. Hell yeah. Yep. Magic. Yeah. I am a watcher. I can't do anything, except <laughs> I can open the cell door. Well, except yeah. Yeah, sometimes I can. And my house is safe. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's just property rights. I can also throw fireballs. <laughs> it's, there's, it's my power set is very, I'm like Wonder Woman, very complicated. It's a little bit, yeah. Set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This next scene is probably my favorite scene in the movie where they're escaping from yes. the jail cell. Yes. Because. The townspeople, they went through all the trouble of setting up like this fake harvest festival or whatever with the uh-huh. kids singing in order to drug them and put them in this jail cell, right. which they left unguarded. And then <laughs> our heroes, the trio, leave. And as soon as they get out the door of the prison building or the jail building, there are people running at full clip. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. with torches. Four feet, four feet away, which means yes. they were sprinting yes. for the entire block before yeah. that. Yes. They intersected at a certain yeah. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. guys, sprint in circles, and whenever they come out, we'll, we'll be at full speed so that it'll work out. All right, we're, we're going around again. Yeah, no, it seems like the zombies went out for, for a drink at the bar. They're across, they're like, there's no way they'll get out with 
within the 10 minutes that we're at the bar real oh, quick. Oh, fuck, 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 Then they walk out of the bar and they see them going, they're like, Jesus, no, shit. Oh, <laughs> oh this God. devil's going to be real pissed at us for this one. Lyric is going to hang us, which apparently kills us. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sorry, you have to avoid those beers. We'll be back. So, okay. Yeah. So, the, so they're right. Now, these are the zombies. But here's the funniest fucking thing. They couldn't afford to do the zombie makeup for like seven guys to, to be chasing them. So they have them all wearing cloaks. And at one point, Mike Norris throws the cloak back and we see the one zombie that they could do the makeup. On. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still wasn't convinced that they're all zombies. No, they're not. Oh, okay. I think that the no, no, no. I, I don't know. Like the oh. people in the cloaks and all that. Yeah. I don't. I, I'm not convinced they're all. They might have just been the one. Well, later on in the movie, we see zombies with their faces covered in uh -huh. the cloaks, and then just regular old Red, dudes and other people with, wearing cloaks. those same yeah. cloaks. Yeah, no, that's yeah, true. the same cloaks. That that makes a lot of sense though. If you've got like three zombies, spread it out a bit. You know, just yeah, <laughs> everybody dressed like the zombies. That is wise. I really want to see the HR meetings for the mixed workplace with the zombies. It's just like okay, so. For for instance, uh, one harmful stereotype about zombies is that we eat flesh. That's not true. Huh? <laughs> Sensitivity training with zombies. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you guys go after work? Well, that's a funny story. <laughs> Emerita sends us back underground. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so they're getting chased by the zombies. Chuck Norris is off in the distance using his magic. Like, he, he has a magical finger that shoots fireballs that creates a wall of flames for them. Mm -hmm. Just, again, random shit. So they run to Chuck Norris's house, and there's a moment there where, like, apparently the zombies, he has, like, the invisible fence. You know the stuff that you you put oh, down for your dog, and it, it smells weird, the dog runs off from it? It's like that, but for zombies. He's got yep. that around mm -hmm. his property. Yep. Right, right. No, no, no. This is just totally normal property rights. This, yeah, thank this is you. just libertarianism. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. This is just you can't you can't infringe upon somebody else's property. Everybody right. follows the rules. He literally stops a mob of zombies and he's this like, uh, my sovereign citizen, maritime yeah. law, assholes. And they're like, sorry, exactly. sorry. Yeah. Well, you got us. Yeah, these uh, these sorts of uh, right wing folk, like the property rights being like the most important thing, they think that it's derived from like cosmic law. Yeah, right. So it well, makes yeah. sense that this <laughs> right. Chuck Norris ass right. uh, movie would have that be something that even the devil has to follow. Yeah. Well, no. I based annexed on... this property legally <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> in 1944 and I'll be goddamned if you're going to step one foot on my acreage. I've combined my labor with the land. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and zombies are like, no, 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 seriously, stop. Like, yeah, right. Come on. We're living in a society. Like, yeah. how are we going to have, we have to yeah. have property hey, rights. Hey, hey, bro, no, don't break the non <laughs> Principle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but but then one zombie like acts like he's not buying this property line shit. So Chuck Norris waves his magic finger on him, and that guy just goes down, right? But he doesn't. He doesn't like evaporate or whatever because no. they can't afford that special effect. Nope. So there's this fucking fantastic moment where he's like, "You have no power," and the zombie in the background is just like, "Oh, he fucking got me right in the fucking tent." Ow! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it stinks. It stinks. He goes down the same way they do with like the searchers or something, where they just grab their belly and they're oh. like, "Oh," and yeah. then they fall. Exactly. Oh, you got me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, so, but then the bad guys just fuck off. They're like, okay, well, you know what? But they'll have to go later, leave, and then we'll get their souls dead when they're not on your property, motherfucker. Yeah, what are they going to do? Stay at your house the whole time until Cut somebody up. comes and picks them up with a reasonable <laughs> car that we have established exists in this town. <laughs> and it's owned by someone who wants to help them. Yeah, yeah yep. who wants to get out too? Mm -hmm. I'm so stupid. <laughs> So, but yeah, but then they're like, so what should we do now? And Chuck Norris says, you guys might as well get some sleep. You got a long night ahead of you. It's just like, they've been napping constantly in this movie. <laughs> they're sleeping like fucking cats. I don't know how to transition to the next scene. Night, night. <laughs> you go to night, night. Anyway, so he goes outside and Chuck Norris explains that, yes, he is the main character, regardless of what David A.R. White might think. <laughs> it's all going to come down to him and his decisions. Right. David A.R. White does think he's the he's acting like totally. he's the main character. Absolutely. He's acting like that. Yeah. No yeah. And it seems like yeah. he's kind of a side character at best. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He doesn't really do anything. Although in the chase scene, 
that where they escaped from the prison. Mm-hmm. Didn't A.R. White get a good kick in on one of the zombies? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think yeah. he got a good side <laughs> kick in, too, which was that like, was, that's that... very clearly a Chuck Norris kick. You are, that's copyright infringement. Yeah. <laughs> that was where I thought this movie was going to turn into like an yeah, action movie. Yeah, it was movie. supposed to be a punch movie. Yeah, yeah that's no. what it, I thought was, for sure. It was a zombie movie for one second, and now it's a different movie. I literally think that happened because Mike Norris got to kick something right before that. And David R. White was like, well, obviously, if Mike's going to kick something, I'm going to kick something <laughs> <Yeah>. right. <laughs> right. And totally. Like, okay, David, you can kick a zombie in the chest. I think you're right. And, and, and Oren's like, I'm not kicking anything. <laughs> it really had the feel like that was the one scene they did 10 takes on yes. to get the kicks right. <laughs> Everything else they did in a weekend. No big deal. We finished the movie. And then that one, they were like, okay, we, we got to spend a whole Saturday <laughs> on just this kick because David White is going to be pissed. So, <laughs> all right. So then, sometime later, Davy and Oren also wake up, and and Mike explains that they're here to save the children from the satanic soul sucking thing. Yeah, and what's amazing is they're like, that makes no sense, and he's like, no, it's true. That is the plot of this stupid movie now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chuck Norris is like, there's a plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. And I just want to point out one other thing about this scene. Towards the end, Chuck Norris is required to say a define epiphany, mm-hmm. and he does not <laughs> no. get into the word epiphany. He's like, no. it's a divine epiphany. <laughs> yeah, they, they took as many Fee. tries as that as they did as the at the zombie kicking scene, <laughs> and eventually they just gave up. Yeah, epiphy is the closest they got. <laughs> yep. Hey, Chuck, do you want to take that one one more time? Nope, nope. No. You only do one take. You're going to be gone here. Oh, you're leaving. Oh, oh okay. you're leaving. Right, He's okay. walking away. All right. All right. Well, there you uh, divine epiphy. Okay. I guess uh, I guess a is what we get for the movie. <laughs> but so then at long last, they're like, wait, can you just fucking lay out the goddamn plot for us? And then Chuck's like, yes, it's the third act I can finally make with the whole backstory. So we learned that this town used to be... Now, you and I thought this fucking thing was going to flash back to 1932 and make some sense out of that cold open, but no. Yep. That would make sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's why we don't fucking do it. We go back to, like, the 1800s. 180 years, specifically. Okay. 1823, if we assume 2003 is the present. Oh, okay, We yeah. have spent a lot of time thinking about that exact issue. <laughs> it's a big problem. Yes. <laughs> we, have, we watched it together on Monday, and I don't know if we've talked about anything since, and we were recorded an episode in between then and now. Yes, because it used to be 180 years ago. It was a town called St. Augustine, Texas, and it was very Jesus-y back then. Correction. Small correction. Yes. Texas didn't exist at right. that time. There is that. Thank that you. is an issue. It was Mexico. <laughs> Texas uh, was invented in invented in invented. 1845. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that should be taking place when the 180 years flashback. That's 13 years prior to the Alamo. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And this entire town is a group of white people. So it's fairly easy to put to, two and two together and say, these are invaders trying to take over Mexican land at this point. <laughs> right. But it shouldn't have even been, it should have been Spanish missions. Exactly. Yeah. yeah based yep. on the timing and where, like, mm. where it's at. Yeah. And they're Catholics, if, uh, if, if <laughs> right. our history is correct. Right. So, but yeah, but then one day this idyllic town in pre Texas, their 4 4 piano music was overtaken by a driving drum beat. <laughs> and this is where we meet little kid emeritus. Right. So Emeritus was just a little boy back in 1823 when the demons came running into town. Now, Chuck Norris is calling these characters demons. We can see them. They're Mexicans. Yep. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. They're just banditos. Yep. He's calling them demons of darkness. They're just Mexican. That's not how euphemisms work. <laughs> he did this narration while watching the dailies. He was like, there they are. The demonly deadly. OK. <laughs> and what's what's what? Boggles my mind about this is if you think about this in reverse with these crazy Christian lunatics, right? So you have got a group of fucking illegal immigrants moving into Mexico at a time when it's not theirs, building their own little sediment, taking their fucking resources and land. And then the banditos show up and get rid of these people the way that the Christian right thinks is a good idea to do if people come to America. (laughs) Absolutely. Yes. But apparently this is where Emeritus is turned to the devil's ways by the evil devil magic and slits the priest's throats. Yeah, but he didn't 
he didn't make a choice at all. No, he was trying nope. to save the town. The, 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 uh, but, uh, well, maybe you're being well, generous. That's, I am being generous with <laughs> yeah. the slitting the priest's throat, saving but the town. But the kid <laughs> turns evil because that guy appears to him and touches him. The kid yeah, didn't yeah. make a choice of yeah, any kind. Marshall just, Teague. Yeah, Marshall Teague shows up and yeah. turns him evil. Yeah, it's exactly like the plot of Mighty Ducks 2. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, Marshall Teague has been in one movie <laughs> and he just does the same thing every year. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, but apparently, so when when Emerita slit the priest throat, that started like a, I don't know, like a cooties of evil that then spread to all the kids, so that their souls would get sucked out at the age of twelve, because that's how old mm-hmm. Emeritus was when Marshall Teague sucked his soul out. It's a it's a yearly tradition now. He slit that priest's throat, got Satan powers, and he was like, "We should do this every year, like Christmas, huh?" This is right, fun. right. <laughs> but how can it be a yearly tradition for there 180 aren't enough years? There aren't enough people in there. There just town. aren't enough for There's a yearly tradition. Thirty people there now. Yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, and if you assume like uh, like a generation is what like thirty years, so it's been like six generations in 180 years. Yeah. This town would be dead oh, totally. by this point. Yeah. There'd be the population would have stagnated and dropped, unless, or it would be bustling, filled with soulless people. Not if they're not <laughs> bringing in more people from outside the town. Well, they've got rodeo tourism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do a lot then, of fucking see, during now, that that's, rodeo. That's a great movie. How right? they're they're getting people here by rodeo in yes. order to trick them into giving up their children's <laughs> souls. That's a good movie. <laughs> that's the eighties movie I want to watch. A small exactly. satanic town trying to maintain its population so that they can sacrifice a child every year at their annual throat slitting convention. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then Jux has to hold a talent show in order to oh, raise enough go. money to defeat the rich preppy guy. <laughs> the I rich guy it. who's taking down the 12-year-old uh, sacrifice center. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> so, and then they ski race. All right. So, <laughs> And I love this moment, too. So Chuck Norris is still giving us the, the backstory or whatever. Diana shows up. And starts running up to him and he's like, hold on, hold on. I'm not done with the uh, backstory. We're not even out of the fucking flashback, lady. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> and then they finish up the, the flashback. She says, Chuck Norris, you've got to help me. They've taken my son and they're going to take away his soul. And he's like, mm, no. Yeah. Nope, I don't do shit. I'm just a watcher. Now, admittedly, for men, I will unlock their jail cells and even light shit on fire for them. Yeah, but right. you, Diana, are a woman. Have you met Jeremy? He's a douchebag. I don't want to help you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. He is. He is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and he's like, look, I, I get why you would assume that I would be the one that would save your kid, but believe it or not, my kid, my son here is the main character of this one, so I'm going to leave it to... Uh, to him, and she's like, "Really?" That's- this conversation or this scene is where Norris Chuck introduces that, <laughs> like, there's a plan to take over the world or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, there's not. No, it's a plan no. to take over the world. I don't buy it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 it's it's a plan to take over the world, Dan. It's like he's trying to punch up the stakes last minute because no yes, one's impressed right, with saving Jeremy. No totally, sense. we must save Jeremy. Uh, I'm fine with Jeremy going away. Yeah, Jux, <laughs> Jux is an unrelatable, unlikable hero. Yep. The story doesn't appear to have any stakes that I should Mm-mm. care about. No. Nope. So they're just faking it at yep. the end. Yeah, and it's a self-contained problem considering that in the opening sequence, we see that the only people they are trying to kill are people who are trying to escape from there. Right. <laughs> well, and, okay, so, and I love this moment, too, because Chuck Norris basically lays down the sticks, and he's like, yeah, they, the whole world is going to be destroyed, and all the killed children's souls will be sucked down by demons, and the only people that can save them is you. And then we watch, like, a montage from a distance of them chatting out whether or not they're going to save those kids for a while. I like that montage. Yeah, I, that, I th- was, that was pretty good. <laughs> I like a montage that has no action. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want any action. I wanted to know that they were talking it out. Yes. I feel like that's an uh, that's the only democratic kind of circumstance we've had in this entire movie so far. <laughs> Everything else is people telling you what to do. People tell you this is the one scene where they're like, let's get together and really think about the best course of action. For I us. just want to know what they talked about. Like, what's the counter argument? 
right? <laughs> like, is Orin just going like steal Diana's yeah, car? Right. Or we could just tell this town to go fuck itself and let the world get taken over by demons, guys. All I right. Mean, how many kids do they have to let us touch after we say it? Let's get an <laughs> opening offer going now. Shouldn't the conversation be like, I don't believe Chuck Norris? Yeah. <laughs> Who the fuck is this guy? Yeah. He's obviously He's- wearing a fucking wig. He's not even being honest about his hair. So <laughs> everything that's happened in this movie so far, for the most part, could be explained by people just being weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I don't understand this town's customs. Obviously, they're evil and I must yeah, destroy right, them. Right. Exactly. I gotta <laughs> that makes sense. I love to. So they, they, they eventually they decide they're going to save the kids. They walk up to Chuck Norris. And they're like, hey, man, we, we've agreed to save the kids. But um, out of curiosity, who are you in this movie that you're not helping us now? I come down from God to unlock one jail cell fire poke one zombie in the tit and then I just <laughs> set you out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I'm Mike Norris's father. This is all I'm doing. <laughs> Whatever. You guys figure it out. I said I'd point. All right. So they head out to kick some ass silhouetted by the sun, a little bit more cool walking. And then we have the weird scene where Chuck and Lyric are talking like they're doing a little shit talk between, I guess, the angel and the main demon or devil. Yeah, they still hang out. <laughs> and let me be very clear here. If this scene had ended in a fist fight between Chuck Norris and this little girl, it's my favorite movie in the world. Yeah. It's his granddaughter. And I'm going to be honest, she outacts the shit out of Chuck. Yeah, in that she scene. does. Sure. She exactly. kills Chuck. She True. wipes the floor with him. Yep. Well, and then and, uh, apparently we're going to go down the chain, right? Because then she leaves and Marshall Teague shows up to talk some shit to Chuck. Mm-hmm. That would imply that Marshall Teague is higher in the hierarchy, but I don't think he is. I'm telling you, I think he's the literal devil in this one. I am telling you, they are co-demons at cross purposes. <laughs> I insist upon this. I'm telling you, there is literally no way. This is the fucking, this is the lyrics to goddamn Stairway to Heaven. One more time, there's literally no way to make it make sense, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, Okay. So that evening, the town has taken all the kids away and everybody's screaming again, like keeping in mind that we've not established a reason why all of these people wouldn't just fight them. You know, they'd be totally fine with it. Or, or yeah, yeah. That, what, my problem isn't fighting them. Everybody in that town should know what's up. Right. Yeah, yes. Their souls were stolen at 12. <laughs> yeah. You don't forget that you don't have a soul. No one should be surprised by anything that happened. You're right. And they're all running around screaming, going, oh, the children, the children. Also, this is where the peacock shows up to herald the arrival of the heroes. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's singing along with the music and everything. The music is pretty good, though. It's a, it's a jam. <laughs> <laughs> it's great music here. Okay. But this is so fucking amazing because. Mike Norris and David A.R. White insisted that they get to do like badass slow motion walk through this scene. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Except the stakes are children are being stolen all around them. Yes. In real time. Yes. So it's like, please help me, my baby. And he's like, I walk alone in Rosie. Urgency is your friend here, guys. Yes. The fucking one woman runs up to Mike Norris and says, please save my baby. And he just throws her off to one side. Yeah. No one helps women at all in this. No one helps anyone in this movie. Here's the thing. If this scene, spoiler alert, where Badass Walk was leaving to a big fight sequence, it kind of makes sense in movie ease, but it isn't. They no, just nope. walk badassly to their next location. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it took on a real slapstick quality. Like they're mm. badass walking and then there are a bunch of people like with watermelon carts all around them that they have to <laughs> avoid. There's panes of glass being taken and they're like, well, we got a badass walk. We don't have time for your pane of glass, sir. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I love to, cause, so they, they eventually they slow walk their way up to a line of bad guys and then the bad guys just move out of their way and they're like, oh, you trying to get over here. You just want to go over there. I guess that's fine. <laughs> you can go over there. No worries. <laughs> Why were we chasing you so hard earlier? <laughs> right. It's really confusing when uh, we realize you would just you would just wind up here anyways. Yeah. Uh, real real boner on our part. We're zombies. <laughs> so and then so they finish their slow walk. They get past the bad guys. They go into this church and Lyric is there and and she's like, "So do you want to fight the bad guys and save the children, or do you want to be my daddy forever and join Satan?" He's like, "I'll be your daddy forever and join Satan, I guess." What? 
<laughs> this this is where I was like I was like what ha I missed a third of the movie is all I can conclude I I stopped watching the version I found on YouTube and I was like oh okay there's obviously like an extra 40 minutes on the DVD that will make this scene make sense no it was just baffling I thought it was too obvious that he was playing possum yeah. or whatever but then it appears that he wasn't but then he was yeah <laughs> it's very poorly done yeah <laughs> yes. well, and, and the agreed and the best part of it is is that davy and Oren follow him right he's like yes i will go hand in hand with this little girl to the temple of human sacrifice and davy and Oren not being cajoled or anything in any way just follow him going jocks i think it's a really bad idea man i don't think we should go into the temple of human sacrifice jocks come on dude right they just willingly walk in with him mm-hmm what? You're not going to let your buddy who plays Russian roulette every morning walk into a demon sacrifice temple by himself. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that guy is clearly not making good decisions right now, okay? This is when he needs friends, okay? <laughs> They're walking by and I'm like, Chucks, don't do that. Not in front of the hell spawn, man. Come on. Chucks. <laughs> Chucks. And then, and then they sit politely so the sacrifice can happen. Right? Like a wedding. They sit on the not demonic side and right, Jux yes, and the little girl sit on the demonic side. side. <laughs> Are you with the bride of Satan? I didn't, consider, I didn't even think about the wedding. Yeah, that's totally right. Is this a zombie usher? Are you uh, on the evil side? Or the evil side? <laughs> no. Notice you still have flesh on your bones. I'll let you go to that side. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, so then we have this stupid fucking who the hell even knows moment where Satan's tempting him and they have the opportunity to join him or love Jesus anyway. Okay, but everyone gets a I choose Jesus monologue. So by the third one, it's so <laughs> boring and they're so mad because yes. everyone else got a monologue first. Right, David Ayer White's like, I choose Jesus and there's nothing that'll break my faith. And then fucking Carrie, sporting goods salesman is like, same, same. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> also, yeah. This scene is such like that. It's like I grew up in. A, I don't know if you know any of my backstory, but I grew up in such a super evangelical uh, household. And this scene, such is like that moment that I've heard so many times in youth groups, where this type of dude masturbates to the idea that he will get that chance to be like, mm -hmm. "I'll die for God." Yes, like that is their <laughs> biggest fucking fantasy that they have even more than shooting somebody for walking onto their property uh, by accident <laughs> yeah <laughs> i also love it we, we have to talk about the skull face effect they do for emeritus here it looks oh, great that's great looks that was great. great come on oh, that's that was great. amazing really i cannot <laughs> get enough skull face oh. and they know it they know i'm not gonna be able to get because they keep going back to the well on it over and over again <laughs> and every time i love it I can't believe they had the uh, money and the budget for a peacock after, uh, <laughs> after those special effects. It's I want him to start doing church announcements with Skullface. Also, Tuesday is the potluck. <laughs> Make sure you sign up for something. Don't just bring something. If everything goes well, we will have the 24th rodeo next year. <laughs> Come on, Jux, come to the dark side and there will be another rodeo. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, but so Jux plays like he's ready to renounce Jesus, though, right? Because it's it's amazing. They go down the list and they're like, will you die for your Lord? I'll die for my Lord. Will you die for your Lord? I'll die. For and then they get to Jux. He's like, yeah, no, no. <laughs> so, I want to fuck this 10 year old that I'm holding hands yeah. with in a few. <laughs> so Emeritus gives him a fucking gun. I love that too. He gives him a little gun instead of like the sacrificial ritual dagger or something. He's like, no, nah, I just got a six shooter, man. Here you go. And he's like, yeah, dagger would have been better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, a snub nosed revolver will do in a pinch. I guess. You know, if he, maybe he left his dagger at home. A lot of people who he it's not expected, in his toiletries. Yeah. He expected that everybody in the town would be like calm and chilled out. Yeah. And instead, they're all running around. So he couldn't find his yeah, dagger yeah, in the Jesus time. Christ, man. Nobody has a dagger. Nobody brought a fucking There's dagger. There's no way that guy. everybody in this cast doesn't have a tactical knife on their belt at all times. <laughs> Okay. 100%. Uh, no, you're right. <laughs> the sacrificial tactical knife. Yes. I got these for free with my Ray Bans. <laughs> they actually fold out of the side of my Ray Bans. <laughs> my sunglass hut. So, 
All right, but yeah. So then Mike turns to them with the gun and he's like, I'm going to kill you for Jesus. And they're like, yeah, no, we just said we were good with that. Are we going to do this again? We're going to do this again. Okay, we're going to go around the room again. All right, fine. But then he turns the gun on Emeritus. Dun, dun. <laughs> he goes, but are you willing to die for your God? And he's like, that doesn't count. That's different. I'm. That's a dumb question, too. Yeah. Like, of course. I already fucking did. Yes, <laughs> idiot. Right. right. Exactly. Duh. <laughs> I'm 200 years old now. <laughs> what do you want from what? I'm bored by this at this point. <laughs> oh, no. A guy has a gun on me testing yeah. my faith in the oh, devil. Oh, no. Oh, I met the devil. She's next to you. Right. Someone just tried to rush me with a knife and I telekinetically stopped her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm worried right. about a gun. Oh, no. Ooh. Well, and then and then fucking Davey has to pipe in and be like, but Jux, don't kill Emeritus. And I'm like, he's for all you guys know at this point, he's the devil incarnate. Yeah. Why would you be trying to stop him? But no, he he can't do it because he's too Christian. So then Lyric shoots him to death instead. Well, wait, that is that is debatable. Up for, yeah, is, that, yeah. is that what happened? Okay. I have no idea what happened for the rest of the movie. Does anybody <laughs> have any theories? I don't know who is who, which nope. direction any guns were facing, nope. what the plot was. Here's my theory on what happens next. We Thank all you. are going to have different theories. Yeah, we're all going to have different theories. <laughs> Here's have my none, theory. So I'm on board with whatever. As far as I can get with how movies talk. So he's pointing the gun at Emeritus and then he's like, okay, I won't shoot him because I'm super God. And then we see Lyric take the gun and shoot Emeritus. But then we get a weird little moment right. where it turns out that he was holding the gun the whole time. Yeah. It does, so right. it's the gun what? doesn't transfer back to his hand. Exactly. But it's there. It's, but it was there. And he's looking at it. His finger's on the trigger. His finger's on the trigger. Yeah. Yeah, he's you're right. And then, and then the kid and what? then Emeritus turns back into his kid form, too. Right. Exactly. And, so it suggests and, and that then, he did kill him. And then the screen, <laughs> uh, the video starts flashing back and forth really fast between the child child who's dead of Emeritus yeah, yeah. and Jux holding the gun, yeah. which seems to imply cause and effect. Yeah, Jux killed the kid is the only thing right. that you can assume <laughs> again. So, so once again, yeah, this movie, this movie, the hero of this movie kills at least two children. <laughs> at, least two, <laughs> at least, at least two well, children. But hold on a second, because in the next scene, he wakes up in his house right before they left to go to Mexico. And none of this has even happened. No, I was kidding. It is. It or has. has it did. It. It but did then happen. later because, on, it turns out it actually right, did happen. Because then Lyra calls him and he goes, no, no, it's not a flash. This wasn't a dream sequence, just in case yeah. you were thinking. <laughs> yeah. And then and then at the end, we see White and Comic Relief or walking out of their walking out of the church and their wives and stuff come with them. Yeah. Or show up to pick them up. But Jux doesn't leave. I think what happens is Jux murders his daughter, some interstitial stuff, then he kills Emeritus, and then he kills himself. That's the movie. Right, because, yeah, he wakes huh. up in heaven, right, with his daughter. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's the next scene. We, we see Davey and, and Oren being reunited with their family. They're, and if you assume that Jux died in this, they're way too happy in this moment, right? Oh, <laughs> celebratory. Super stoked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hey, we made it, guys. And Jux died. It was a what? win for everyone. <laughs> he was such a wet fucking blanket. He's, you know that pilot we knew who was always trying to touch other people's kids? He's dead. Yes. Right. <laughs> the one that That's killed his daughter? Yeah, the one that killed his daughter. Yeah, we start doing board game nights again. So, <laughs> yeah, so when they celebratorily all leave the ritual church area or whatever, where Jux's dead body conceivably is, and they meet all their families, their preacher from the beginning of the movie is with them. Yes. Yeah. And I don't I don't know if you caught this, but like Diana and her son also come out of the ritual church. No. And yeah. almost immediately the pastor shakes hands with her son. <laughs> 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 As if to be like, children can shake hands now. Yeah. See, this, oh, is, wow. this is when we set it up for a sequel where the kid can't shake the pastor's hand yeah. because he's too evil. Oh. Right. That's what you got to do. Oh, oh, shit. Then you've got the... Oh, wait. Two bells, too innocent. <laughs> That's what I'm going with. All right. All ludicrous. All right. <laughs> bells of innocence, too electric boogaloo. Okay. All right. So and then okay, so then we have to get fucking Mike Norris waking up in heaven with Chunk Norris. You know, and and he goes like, so 
What the dad? Fuck? Is this the first time you've loved me? <laughs> yes, it is, son. Yes, it is. But he's got, and he's got to go. So wait a minute. We were not real clear on the end. Is the town okay? Did the children die in the town? And he's like, no, man. Everybody, the town, the children are fine, and the town is reborn. And we, the audience, are like, how, how? and why? why, and from what? <laughs> He might as well say, don't worry, the movie is over. <laughs> yes, yes, that is exactly, that is exactly what the line should have been. Unsatisfying Thank conclusion. Thank God we're done. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. And then, the, and then his dead daughter runs up to him and he looks to Chuck Norris and he goes, am I dead? And he's like, your fucking dead daughter. She, of course you're goddamn dead. <laughs> no, she's what alive. Fuck else would you, yeah, right. Give me she's the last break. zombie. You have to kill her to free the town. <laughs> I wanted her to be like, hey, dad, just uh, hop on this bike really quick. I yeah. you <laughs> that would be hilarious. Push. Yeah, I'm going to give yeah. you a push. So and then <laughs> Marshall Teague shows up all demon behind Chuck Norris. And he goes, you know, this isn't over. And and Chuck Norris is like, I mean, there's a little fucking wrap up scene, but it's it's pretty much it's over. over. We're not doing there's there's not really going to be a two bells to innocence. That, that was just a joke. <laughs> He's like, it's not Chuck Norris's response is like, it's not over until God says it's over. Yeah. And to me, that is a cruel joke. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. Because why does this need to keep happening? Because they imply Marshall Teague and Chuck Norris imply that they've like had a bunch of battles before in the past. Right. And it's like all of this seems trivial and meaningless. Furthermore, how long has Chuck Norris lived outside of that town? Right? 179 years. 179 years, right? So what's Chuck been doing this entire time? Well, <laughs> he, he knows Diana, so he's been there for a while at right. least. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He didn't just show up. in the cold opening. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Well, mm, that's probably I why guess. he has that. Uh, <laughs> Couldn't he have saved the son before the son's dad and that guy were murdered? <laughs> you feel like he could have. He was watching. You feel like he could have. <laughs> I really wanted the camera to pan up to heaven. God's just sitting there eating popcorn. Okay, now... Crash a bus full of nuns and three pornographers into the town. I want to see what happens <laughs> then. Do that one. It does. It does have the feel of like Chuck Norris and Lyric and uh, Marshall Teague are all hanging out from time to time, and they're like, "Okay, all right. Well, this year, yes. what do we got? I'm going to pull out a Mad Libs of three dudes who should Let's show not up. Do another fucking rodeo. So, okay. <laughs> all right. So and then, of course, we close on Mike Norris walking hand in hand with his dead daughter in heaven. And of course, and I brighten in my nose. Wow. Heaven looks like a bit of a shithole. <laughs> yeah. It's like one of the flyover like a states. Yeah. Is that a golf course? <laughs> yeah. So. And they also they also have a shot in the town where people's like devil marks are disappearing. Yes. Uh huh. And, and everybody is kind of acting like. Yay! Hooray! We got our devil marks off. But I never felt like through the course of the movie they showed me that like it was attention for anybody except Diana. Nope. Right. Everybody else didn't seem to have a problem. The kids know. were super stoked to be telling Lyric that it's her turn in front of the Punisher. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everybody seemed pretty happy. But that's just the thing. Nothing makes any fucking sense if these townspeople wanted out and had souls. Why are you staring at those people creepily? You'd kind of want them to stick around and maybe bring some help or something. Yeah, yeah. totally. None of it yeah. makes sense. Script supervisor needed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so, okay, my last question was what was the moral of this story? But I think that's it. Right, I think I think script supervisor needed might be the moral of the story. Yeah, is there a moral? Is there a winner or a loser? Or is there like a reason that like I guess it's supposed to be self sacrifice is the way into heaven or something? But okay, that's it's hard to uh, hard to get there we through this movie. Lost, yeah, well, we did lose. Yeah. That's true. The moral of the story is second draft. <laughs> 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 this is not good enough. Whatever you, whatever you wrote, not good yeah, enough. Yeah, right, right. Another the story is your uh, Chuck and Mike are no uh, Chuck Sheen and uh, Charlie Sheen. Let's put yeah. it that way. <laughs> so, with Chuck and Charlie Sheen, uh, uh, Charlie. Yeah. Oh shit! Never mind. Uh, yeah, whatever. On, I'm losing my mind. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Well, after going through this whole fucking movie, I can't really blame you. So, Jordan, Dan, we have had a blast hanging out with you guys today. If our audience is not ready for that blast to end, remind them where they can go to hear more from you guys. Well, our website is knowledgefight.com and there's uh, you know, there's some stuff they can find on there and yeah. direct them to places where we are. Yeah, awesome. Go awesome. to knowledgefight.com or go to iTunes and look for Bells of Innocence and I think we'll show up eventually. <laughs> we, we, we're we going to start a Bells of Innocence pod. I don't oh, nice. think that's a bad nice. idea. Well, we, we were trying to 
deep dive every week into a new theory of how it all makes sense. I like it. I like it. I'm in. Yeah. All right. And of course, if you if, if you don't want to bother going all the way to iTunes and looking for shit, you can also just check the show notes for this episode where we'll have that linked. Jordan, Dan, thanks so much for hanging out with us, guys. It's been an absolute blast. Thank you. Thank we you. had a great time. What a treat. All right. And well, that does it for our review of The Bells of Innocence. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to lure you back. So, Eli, tell us what's on deck. Sonny Boone was always a fighter and a champion, but when he loses everything, he blames God. At his lowest point, Sonny is roaming the streets for a place to sleep and scrounging for food in a dumpster. We'll be watching God, Where Are You? Oh, that sounds like such a blast, Eli. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you for that. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 293 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Jordan and Dan, and a perhaps even a huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per-episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful, and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you've enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation Data, D&D Minus, and The Skeptic Ride, available on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever else podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawful movies at gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Our theme song is written and performed by Rise Slot, Thinking People Drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a check of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm going to lose his promise to work harder and earn another check next week. Until then, we'll leave you with the Breakfast Club close. David A.R. White went on to a long career of very slow dive rolls for a gun. <laughs> Mike Norris would go on to nothing. <laughs> we did a couple of his nothings. Chuck Norris would go on to be very disappointed to find out this didn't count towards his child settlement. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2021. All rights reserved.